Uh, it's 5.30, I'd like to convene this uh, meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Board of Directors to enable audio control. Please enter for your November audio 2nd, 2023. If you do not have a pin, Take roll. just press pound or hat. The Director organizer Smiley. has not yet started Here. the meeting. You will be placed on hold until an organizer Vice President starts. Hill. <laughs> Director Ackman. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. And Director Foles. Here. Director Foles is um, participating remotely. Okay. Um, with no members of the public in attendance um, here, um, I see nobody that wants to comment on anything on the agenda. Um, does anybody who is attending remotely want to comment on items on the agenda for the closed session? Seeing none, um, we will adjourn now to the closed session. The open session starts at 6.30. We will see you then. I have 6.30, so I'd like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for November 2nd, 2023. Holly, would you take the roll, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackman. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. And Director Fulce. Here. Director Fulce is uh, participating remotely. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, segue uh, for just a minute uh, from our standard agenda. Uh, we have uh, County Supervisor Bruce McPherson here this evening. He has another meeting that he needs to go to to address uh, big basin water issues. Um, and he is asked to speak for uh, a short period uh, so that he can get to the other meeting quickly. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, on one of the agenda items this evening, but we're going to let him speak so that he can then leave. I really appreciate that because we have a, a, a meeting in Big Basin in just another half hour. Um, and uh, I, I'm presenting a resolution to somebody who doesn't really want it or care about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm not going to reread it as I promised you because, but uh, Rick Rogers is San Rosa Valley Water District. And you know, the the best of people will come out in the most challenging times. And boy, you've had your share of them, I know that. We have here in the Valley of the County throughout. But <clears throat> thank heavens we have somebody that is so dedicated and so sincere and so, so much in love with this Valley that he wants to see it done right. So I just, uh, whether he likes it or not, on behalf of the County Board of Supervisors, I just want to say to Rick Rogers, thank you for your long years of service. You're a class act. That's all you have to say. You really are, and a great friend too. Uh, I, I just want to say that I don't know what Santa Rosa Valley would have done without him. And uh, I hope the best of you in the future because he laid the groundwork to, to move ahead from here. So. Thank you, Rick, and whether you want or not, you're just... <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, uh, back to the rest of the regular agenda. Um, the board has nothing to report out from our closed session um, this evening. Um, any changes to the agenda? Chair, staff has none. Okay. Uh, oral communications. 
uh, for members of the public that wish to speak on something that's within the district's purview uh, that's not on the agenda this evening, uh, does anybody want to speak? Uh, I see one hand up, uh, Jim Mosier. Jim? Is that it? He's muted on his side. Oh. You're... You see me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, no. I, I, uh, this is technically right, I guess, because I want to just also add my admiration and thanks to Rick Rogers for the incredible service he's given the Valley. Jim? And, uh, it's really getting us through these last three years of just amazing. Jim, that's, we've been so fortunate and so rare. That's, I just want that's, to say thanks. that's the first item on the agenda. <laughs> uh, but thank you for the comment. Um, so, uh, moving on then to new business. Um, appreciation for Rick Rogers upon his retirement. Um, I, I can't do the same justice that uh, Bruce McPherson just did, but the board also has a resolution. Uh, likewise, I am not going to read uh, from it verbatim, but just capture a few things from it. Uh, Rick has been working for the Water District since 1975. Um, his uh, tenure with the district uh, brings a, uh, a wealth of knowledge that he has had. Uh, his uh, encyclopedic references to be able to say uh, when things were put in um, is immeasurable. Um, he is served above and beyond the call of duty for the district uh, in keeping the water flowing during a major earthquake, the Loma Prieta, uh, the freeze emergency in 1990, numerous um, floods or as we're now calling them atmospheric river storms um, over the years, um, the fire in, of CZU in 2020, um, at the same time during the fire, I want to remind folks that it was during COVID conditions. So dealing with all of that and still keeping the water on, I have to commend him for that. Uh, Rick has also been instrumental in um, improving water re reliability in the Valley in general with efforts on the mergers of Felton, and the Lompico water systems um, and consolidation efforts uh, with Bracken Brand Four Springs. Um, with that, um, I want to read the last paragraph in the, in the resolution um, and make it a motion. I want to make a motion that uh, now be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District that Rick Rogers is hereby commended for 48 years of dedicated service to the district. He has a deep respect of all who have worked with him and he is viewed with affection and gratitude by the community. His tireless work ethic, deep knowledge of the district's water systems and devotion to the district and the San Lorenzo Valley will be sorely missed. Indeed. Here, here. <laughs> okay, I did want to say yes that that is a motion. Okay, uh, we have a motion out, uh, and I'll go out for comments to the board and the and the public that's here in attendance and online. Um, Rick did ask me to please keep it short, so um, and I said okay, then let's limit it to one minute for public comments. So with that. Uh, from the board, Jeff. So I'm here because I had a meeting with him uh, a couple of years ago. I had a, a water issue that wasn't really related at all to this district, but I needed some advice on something. And we had uh, lunch over at uh, Heavenly Cafe. And we had a really great lunch and 
that inspired me to get involved. And I think he came back and said, we've got to recruit this guy. So uh, sort of a mutual thing. And uh, thank you. It's thank been you. very nice. Jamie? I, I won't embarrass you, but I will say that it's it's your tough act to follow for the, our customers as well. You're somebody that is really trusted. Um, when people have issues, they feel like they can reach out to you and, you know, that you will be really responsive. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I know that you'll be missed. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, you, you will be missed um, by the board and also by the members of this community who have a deep and abiding affection for you because you always talk clearly to them and tell them what, what's up uh, with us. And you've engendered a lot of trust in that. Also, the fact we'll miss you because basically in your 48 years of service, you've embodied the modern history of the district. You're a, a walking encyclopedia in that regard. And so um, that makes you extremely uh, hard to replace. And I just want to personally ask you for, uh, thank you for the relationship that you and I had the two years that I was president um, of the board. And I really enjoyed uh, working with you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bob Foltz, who's participating remotely this evening. Bob? Yeah, in the interest of, of keeping it short, um, yeah, I won't add on to what everybody else has said other than to say I, I wish you a happy retirement. Rick. Thank you for your no time. Okay, uh, members of the public uh, that are here in attendance, anybody want to comment on this? You want to go? I'll go right after you, Rick. I'm uh, Rick Moran, and I'm from Bethel. <coughs> I'd like to thank Rick for his 48 years of work for this water district. What a rare accomplishment. If he was a ball player, he would be retired his jersey tonight. <laughs> As someone who has a few years of retirement under my belt, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the coming years. I'm especially grateful for your significant role in stopping the use of Roundup in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. As Director of Operations, Rick was concerned about his war workers being exposed to dangerous glyphosate. We both knew people who were suffering from the effects of Roundup. We worked together to ensure our water district found a safer approach to weed removal. Thank you, Rick. And the next time we run into each other, I'll buy you a beverage of your choice, and it won't be water. <laughs> Okay. Is this, this isn't closed session any longer? Uh, no, this is oh, not. Okay. Thank you for oh, oh, yeah. Yes, okay. please, Eric. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm David McNair uh, with the neighboring agency. Um, I just want to say really quickly uh, that I, I first met Rick in 1980, 43 years ago. Rick was a star in this business. Um, as he did to a lot of us, I think James and Scotty could testify uh, that uh, he's been a he was a wonderful guy to work with. Um, we worked through a lot of disasters in the eighties uh, that it seemed like every other year we're having a major federally declared disaster uh, that we had to deal with. And frankly, the, those experiences, the earthquake, the eighty two storm, the eighty six storm, the freeze, those were really some of the highlights of my career to this day. Um, working through those things and, and uh, getting the system back together. Uh, it was really a very rewarding experience, and, and I can still remember uh, long, long nights uh, working out in the rain and freezing temperatures, putting mains back together on Highway 9. And, uh, the list is endless, but um, Rick was a, was a guy that, if you knew, if you had, he always had your back, and if you knew uh, he was behind the project, it was going to get done. Um, one way or another. Um, you can always come up with creative ideas on how to do stuff. And uh, um, he was just a great example. Um, and he's been a friend. And he's always been someone I've been able to call. And I've always appreciated that. Uh, throughout the last 43 years, I can't believe that after tomorrow, uh, I can't call Rick for some advice. So um, uh, he's, I just, I'm going to miss him. And I think that as, as, as stated, you are the San Lorenzo Valley when it comes to water. Uh, you've been doing it forever, and um, we're all going to miss you. Okay. 
Um, anybody else from the public here? Are we speaking uh, as the public or are we speaking as staff? You're going to give us a chance. Um, let me go to the public. That's fine. Uh, I'm just wondering if we're public on this or if um, we're. Let me go. Let me go to the front. Um, the since we started with the public here, yes, I'll give uh, staff also the opportunity. Thank you for that reminder. Okay, um, we'll go to the uh, public online. Um, I'll go back to uh, Jim Mosier. Since you still have your hand up, uh, Jim. Oops, I didn't mean to have my hand up. I apologize for being out of order, <coughs> but after McPherson's resolution, it would be proper. But anyway. I just want to echo what everybody else is saying. It's been great working with you, Rick. And I hope that uh, I can continue to work with you informally uh, while you're not actually the director. And thanks so much for all your dedication and help to the ballot. Okay. Uh, Larry Ford. There you go. This is Larry Ford, resident of Felton. I want to say that I really enjoyed hearing all the accolades for you, Rick. I remember first meeting you sometime in the early 2000s when there was the flow effort to get the Felton Water District um, into SOV Water District. And you, uh, of all the people that we could have asked questions of, you always had a very reliable and practical answer to our questions about what was really going on, both uh, in Felton and in and in the SLV Water District in general. And I, so I, I learned at that point to really trust your judgment and subsequently trying to be a, a faithful follower of SLV Water District after we bought our way in and uh, to to be involved in politics i found you to be um, just as reliable as a source of of accurate information i remember several times at least when you agreed to have coffee with me to discuss some uh, fire management issues and i really enjoyed that a lot and so uh I, I hope to see her around the valley in the future. Thank you. Hey, uh, Elaine Fresco. Uh, this is Elaine Fresco, Felton. Uh, I just want to say I, I, I was honored to work with you, Rick, on the um, Environmental Committee and to observe you in on the board meetings. I respect your patience. I appreciate your responsiveness to the community. I know your staff has always respected you. And uh, to me, you'll always be the honorary district manager of SLVWD. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Alina Lang. Hi, Alina Lang, Boulder Creek. I just wanted to, you know, echo what everyone's saying and, and thanks for your service, Rick. And it's been a pleasure sitting on the Environmental and Engineering Committee for the last three years uh, with you over there. And I uh, hope you have a happy retirement. Okay. Uh, seeing no nobody else online, uh, does the staff like to offer comment? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to go first on that. So I'm just gonna pull an Annie Oak and shoot from the hip on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like that. So I started here at the district 18 years ago um, in the trenches, just as Rick Rogers did when he started here at the district in the trenches. Um, I've learned a lot from Rick over the years, always encouraged to get educated, get certificates, move up in the world. Um, he's aided me along, along that way. I've learned a lot in the 18 years I've been here. Moved up in the district and I feel pretty proud of where I'm at and where the district's at and where Rick's brought the district to. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else wish to speak? Uh, if not, I have one final thing that I'd like to uh, take note of uh, and mention. Uh, 
few of us got together, Rick, um, and we have a, a parting gift. Um, for those that uh, can't see in the audience, I will read to you uh, and describe. It's a clock with all fives on it. Uh, so that it's always five o'clock where you are. Uh, <laughs> since you are no longer working, you are off of the clock, and it's uh, after five o'clock. Uh, thank you. So, with that, I will leave that with you after the meeting. Okay. Um, I think we're. Can I have a minute? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not forgetting. <laughs> Maybe two. I'll try to make it quick. Um, first off, um, I don't Bruce had to go to uh, a meeting down the street to uh, on Big Basin, um, but I thank the county and Bruce for um, his kind words, and I want to thank the board. Um, for their kind words and for working with me and for all the past boards for working uh, with me and uh, staff. Um, you know, a lot was said, a lot of good things were said about me, but let me tell you, if it wasn't for the management team and the employees of the district, I wouldn't have been able to pull it off um, through all those disasters and storms and, and what we do. We have a, an excellent management team and we have an excellent staff. We've been through some bumps. There's no doubt the staff has been through some bumps through COVID, you know, the horrendous loss of Josh Wolf, um, rocked the district. Um, and um, the different disasters have been difficult. Uh, and Tim McNair had a, reminded me of a humorous story that when he first came to work for the district, I think it was the 82 storm. And I had a policy that during emergency disasters that we would we pair up, that no one person would be out in the distribution system by themselves for safety. And each person was assigned another person, and Dave got assigned with me. Mm -hmm. So that subsequently, was, I think he didn't get home for three days later. <laughs> he was on my couch at you know, three in the morning till five and we were back at it again. But uh, he got the short straw on that one. and. Uh, we were up all night for several days in a row on 1982. That was, a, yeah, 82 was a horrendous storm. And uh, it was a good three days before he uh, was able to go back home. But uh, our employees are so dedicated and you know, they live in this area. CZU Fire, where two of our employees lost their homes while they were out keeping water flowing. Uh, we have an incredible uh, staff. And one of the other great things about the district was all the people that I've met over the years. It had to be hundreds. You know, the communities in Felton, Lompico, and they are all in need of uh, a necessity of life, water. And it was very important that the district, you know, brought that together. And uh, that was one of the high points of my career in the district. Uh, and all the different people we've worked with, even the adversarials or the people that um, weren't happy with what we were doing at the time, um, we worked together and uh, you know, we've become friends with some of them. And a lot of them attended board meetings and uh, a lot of good has come out of it. So it's a very special place to work and I, um, I welcome Brian to the, uh, to the district and if I can help at all and uh, if you have any information, feel free to call me. You got an excellent staff. And again, uh, you know, 48 years and went by in a blank. <laughs> I don't know where it went. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's going to be hard to separate, but I am looking at a lazy boy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm thinking that five o'clock uh, clock and my lazy boy, and, uh, you know, and uh, it'll be pretty good. So again, uh, it's been great, and you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, CZU and all, and this district will always be full speed ahead and have twice as much work as it can handle, so it'll, it'll get through. So thank you. The funny thing is, is Rick's Lazy Boy is his new Kubota tractor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. All right. Any funny else? From staff want to speak for we're good. Okay. Uh,
Yeah, he encouraged me as much as I could to try to keep this short. So yeah. Yeah. otherwise yeah. I wasn't going to be able to make it through the rest of the meeting. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, concluded on that item. Uh, next up. Uh, we haven't taken a... Oh, I'm sorry. Thank resolution. you for that. There's yes. Uh, on the on the, there is a motion on the resolution. Um, it's been moved and seconded. So you can right. Vote. Yes. So... President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes, indeed. Director Fultz? Yes. Okay. Um, next up, we have a discussion on the uh, interim general manager employment agreement for Brian Frost. Um, some background on this. Um, in December 2022, uh, Rick Rogers identified that he planned to retire. Um, and at that point, uh, the board began uh, a search with an executive search firm um, headed down that path. Um, the executive search firm, uh, we didn't get engaged until uh, June of this year. In August, uh, Rick identified that uh, he wanted to retire uh, sooner than what he was indicating to us originally and set a date of uh, November 3rd, tomorrow. Uh, based on that, uh, the board uh, elected to begin a search for an interim general manager. Um, in the period between uh, September and uh, in September and October, uh, the board received resumes um, after uh, some searching uh, from six candidates. Uh, we interviewed uh, three individuals, um, and after interviewing all three, elected to start negotiations uh, with Mr. Fruss. Uh, Brian's a uh, registered civil engineer has worked for the city of Salinas um, as the manager of their water, waste, and energy division since 2017, and he lives in Fulton. His resume is uh, included with the agenda uh, packet on this item. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to offer Brian uh, the chance uh, to speak now, if he would like. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm sure everybody's familiar with the phrase that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. <laughs> so as a beer drinker, I'd still say that there's a little bit of truth to the fighting part. Um, after six years of dealing with Monterey, where they have Seawater intrusion, a multi million dollar ag industry that depends on a depleted aquifer, and competition from peninsula interests because there's drought and there's a drought on the peninsula that's the water starved peninsula. And I also kind of reflect that it, I thought it was funny that moving from the desert, Arizona, to the lush Monterey Peninsula when I was a kid, it was the first time I remember having water ration. Now, maybe I know why, but anyway, um, fast forward, I met Rick uh, in 2004, I think. I came up and did some work for the water district. Um, and, you know, since that time, I think it just inspired me that I was hoping that um, maybe someday I'd be able to serve this district in some capacity. So here I am, I'm embarking on that. Um, I've been a Felton resident for 25 years. I was also very much interested in seeing Flo succeed and joining the district. Um, obviously, a lot of challenges with this agency, but I, I think that, as Rick said, 
this agency has never failed me or anybody I know in the Valley for as long as I've lived here. And um, I think we support our local troops here in the Valley. It's, it's, a, it's one of the reasons I live here. It's the community, it's a strong community. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And uh, I'm very glad to be able to serve you. So thank you. Okay. Um, so we have uh, the uh, memo in front of us and the uh, attached employee agreement um, as the agenda item for this evening uh, to discuss. So uh, I wanted to uh, get comments, questions from the board first on both of these items. So, uh, Gail? Yeah. First, let me uh, welcome Brian, and we're really thrilled to have you on board, and I'm really looking forward to working with you. My comments on the, um, it's a little awkward making comments on, on the agreement with you sitting right here in the, in the room, um, but my, my comments really have nothing to do with Brian per se. They have to do with when you're writing a legal document um, that you want to cover all the bases and all the contingencies. And I don't think that Brian needs any of these constraints, but in general, we should be writing legal documents in a way that protects the district. And so um, there were a couple of things that um, I guess I would have liked to have seen some language about. One is, is that to make it clear, especially now that a lot of people think they can work from home uh, post-COVID, that, that this is a job that uh, involves essentially being based in this office and being here uh, most work days, at least for part of the day, that I think it's worth saying something to that effect. Um, I think that the granting of leave is appropriate, the amount is appropriate, but there should be some way of um, that a person has to accrue it during that period, just the way the rest of the permanent employees have to accrue it and can't take all of it in a year. Um, the uh, other is uh, that right now it, it's clear that if we were to um, uh, dismiss Brian <laughs> without cause, he gets the full six months and the sort of uh, finishing bonus, which I think is entirely appropriate because he's taking uh, certainly a big risk and uh, it's a big step to come here and leave a permanent position that he had. And so it, he would certainly deserve that. But I think there should also be something that's a little bit more explicit that if there were some reason, heaven forbid, that he had to be uh, terminated for cause, that we wouldn't pay that whole six months and the rest just out of fairness. And the other is the language about indemnification. And I think this might be kind of old um, in the sense that uh, we've had, the district has had some terrible experiences where uh, the Vieira case is a good example where we ended up paying a lot of legal fees um, for a situation where I think we went beyond the call of duty and indemnifying in that case a board member um, for questionable behavior. And so I think there's language in the board policy manual now that corrects that problem, that makes it clear that if a board member does something that's illegal or improper, that uh, there are limits to the indemnification. And so all I would suggest is that we stay within the letter of the, the state law about having to indemnify employees, but don't go beyond it. Okay. So those, right. are, those are my suggestions. Okay. Um, are you suggesting <laughs> to amend this current agreement? Or? Well, I, you know, I would prefer to, but I, uh, I don't feel okay. super strongly about that. I just think okay. I'm just talking about in general in a, a process okay. that. All right. You, you should write your legal documents with the worst case scenario in in mind, hoping that they never ever. Come right. to pass. Okay. All right. Uh, Jamie? Well, I, I think that for the purposes of the public discussion, it's probably um, appropriate just to sort of talk about a little bit about what this means, bringing on an interim, and um, how the process to identify the, the, the permanent replacement mm -hmm. um, is going to unfold. Sure. Um, so, uh, yes. You know, we've we have had a number of conversations about um, the you know a permanent uh, recruitment because we were in that process um, prior to this, 
And, um, you know, I think that, that we intend to make a final decision about filling the permanent role. And, and I know that, um, Mr. Furs is a candidate for that. And, you know, we'll, but I, you know, how, I guess, what do we want to say about that? Um, I think that, you know, as far as I understand it as a board member, we're going to be looking um, after the new year at sort of where we're at in terms of um, how things are running with the district and whether there have been other candidates who have in that interim period applied that we need to um, take a look at. Uh, but, that you know, I think that it's our hope, obviously, that... Mr. Fruce is a, you know, excellent leader and things are, are running smoothly at that point. And, um, you know, so I just, I don't know if there's anything else that we need to say about that, but I, I think that clarifying okay. that there's still a okay. process. Uh, then I don't know if this is clarifying to, to your point or not, but uh, the board uh, has engaged uh, an executive search firm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we engaged them back in, in June. The uh, advertisement that that executive search firm has is still out there. Uh, if they get applicants, they intend to send those to us. Uh, at some point, uh, the board would be looking at those also, but we have not made as a, as a group of the board yet uh, any decisions on going forward on any of that. Uh, we want to see at this point uh, what Brian brings to us. Uh, and brings to the district. So uh, still working through that process, but we're not closing that general manager search process. That is still open at this point. But, yes, thank you. Okay, Jeff. So it is my sincere hope here that this all works out. I'm confident it will, but this all works out. And in six months, we'll be talking about the permanent contract with Mr. Fuss. And um, I think if the timing of Rick's retirement and such hadn't been changed as it was, we'd probably be talking about the permanent position right now. But uh, I, I think, uh, Brian, you will be on the driver's seat to uh, uh, make this work or not. So. I welcome you and wish you the best of luck and all of that and commit to support your efforts. So. Okay. Um, I wanted to get a comment from Bob. Bob? On the assumption that we're all going to vote the way I believe we are, uh, Brian, welcome aboard and look forward to, uh, to working with you. Um, I think everything else is at this point in time is um uh, speculation best not um covered here uh tonight thank you okay uh then before i go out to uh comments um i'd like to make the motion that the board extend an offer of employment to brian frost for the position of interim general manager as specified in the attached employment agreement second okay uh would anybody here in attendance from the public like to comment? Yes, I would. On this? Okay. As a member of the public. Okay. Um, this is nothing against Brian. Brian, welcome. But I do have an issue with the way that the hiring of the interim manager went down. All district positions that are hired are posted to the district website. And this position was never posted to the district website was never posted to any local newspapers. And it was brought upon staff that we had an interim manager coming in without the no. So just on the board's behalf, is that the legal and the correct way to hire a staff member? That's my only question. It's nothing against the board, nothing against Brian, just something out there. As I know that all positions of the district are supposed to be posted. And this was not. Okay. Just throwing it out there. Okay. That's all I have. Um, Rick, did you want to comment on the discussion that we had about that, or do you want me to? Well, at I, this point, you know, I do know that the rules, regulations, 
state that all positions will be posted, but I do believe it refers to management and classified. I don't know about the district manager position and I did not research it, um, but I do know that our rules and regulations have uh, have guidance on on how to recruit uh, that they are posted and, and okay. so forth, et cetera. But I don't know about the general manager position, and I would refer to council. Okay. What about um, interim? Yeah. Um, you want to get a comment from council? It was my understanding that, or we did post the general manager yes. position. Uh, right. We didn't receive any. Uh, uh, any interest or applications uh, to the general manager position. Um, we did announce after uh, one of the closed sessions, the board's intent to seek the interim general manager. Um, and it was my understanding that no, we did not need to post because this um, is a uh, the district manager that we did not need yeah, to post. Yeah, I, I, I can add something uh, to that. that. No. The permanent Sorry. general manager role was uh, posted yeah. as is appropriate. Yeah. And this is a temporary role and therefore does not is not subject to the same conditions that hiring for a permanent position would be subject to. So. Okay. Okay. As long as you guys are firm on that, I, I don't know. Okay. But I um, guess... Go ahead. Okay. I, I think that's correct, that it's because it's interim and not because it's a general manager. Obviously, the general the manager, you have to post. Best interest for the board. Yeah. Right. But, but I, I guess I would go on and say that I didn't realize we didn't put it up there. And I guess even though we may not be required, it, it wouldn't have hurt <laughs> to put, put it up there. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the future, if that arises again, I guess okay. I, I don't see the damage. Yeah, it, of, of yeah, I, I just didn't yeah. know the rules on, yeah. on it. Right. And I'm just in the best interest of the board. I thought you also know that it wasn't posted. And did, did we post the, uh, I'm drawing a parallel here. Did we post the interim finance, finance director? No. Not oh, no. That was in house recruitment. It was a temporary role, though, as well. She's an interim. No, we did not. With in house recruitment, we never posted. I mean, to get the contract employee, we did. But you know, this was a different process because we, the board handled this process. Right. Yeah. The board and the yeah. HR person didn't. The manager didn't. Right. This was a board's process to hire the general manager, so it was a little different. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else online wishing to comment. Anybody else here in the audience? Seeing none. Um, Holly. President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Brian, well, welcome. Brian, welcome on board. Yes. Yeah. Um, before you leave, Holly has uh, something we'd like you to sign. So, okay. Um, Moving on then to the next item on our agenda um, is the uh, cross-country pipeline, uh, the Peavine above ground construction cost estimates. Yes, thank you. Um, the CZU fire of August 2020 resulted in substantial damage to Santa Cruz County, including 1,300 acres of the district-owned watershed destroying approximately seven miles of above-grade HDPE pipe used for raw water conveyance from the district surface water sources to the water treatment plant. In considering replacement, the district solicited a request for proposal for a constructability study and alternative analysis report. Uh, the constructability report provided cost estimates for replacing the pipe and burying it to protect it from future fire. The report did not provide a cost estimate for replacing the pipe to pre-disaster conditions above ground. At the September 14, 2023 Engineering and Environmental Committee meeting, the committee requested staff to prepare a cost estimate to replace the P-Vine to pre-disaster design above grade. Staff prepared a cost estimate, which is attached to this report, for constructing the pipeline 
uh, as the district did in the late 1980s, above grade. The construction was completed by hand labor using California conservation crews, the CCCs, and local force account labor. Helicopters were used to deliver pipe along the pipeline route. This technique was required as part of the environmental review as the pipe traversed the Ben Lomond Mountain and the use of excavators and road building was considered to be environmentally unacceptable. During the design survey, it was found that large portions, portions of the waterline alignment were likely not accessible by equipment, large or small, without very significant new road trail construction, which would likely be cost prohibited, environmentally unfeasible, and unwarranted in light of the alternative installation method of placing the pipe above grade. Uh, attached is the cost estimate for replacing the P-Vine to pre-CZU fire uh, above grade, utilizing the same construction methods, helicopter CCC hand crews, living and spike camps, and local force account labor. A CCC crews would uh, reestablish the pipe bench and force account labor would install the new pipe. Now, as of today, the CCCs were out today and uh, evaluated uh, the pipeline and the, the discussion with the director of operations and the CCCs, the Cs may want to take on the installation of the pipe, which again would uh, uh, considerably reduce the cost uh, of labor. The total cost estimate for the above ground construction is $2,036,000 and change, and that includes a 20% contingency. As indicated on the spreadsheet, uh, a considerable amount of the equipment was also be utilized in the reconstruction of the five mile Clear Creek Sweetwater Pipeline uh, rebuilding project, bringing the cost even lower. FEMA grants would cover 90% of the cost to pre existing conditions. The constructability study technical memorandum. Um, an alternative analysis report by Freyer and Loretta estimated the cost to construct below ground to between $10.8 and $12.5 million and does not include tree removal. Burying the pipe may have substantial cost to the district as the additional cost for burying are approximately $10.5 million and would have to be negotiated with FEMA. On October 18, 2023, the Engineering Committee reviewed the cost estimate and discussed replacing the pipeline. A quorum of the committee president voted in favor of recommending moving ahead with their replacement, starting with hazardous tree removal, trail bench rebuilding, and environmental review as needed. And there is a proposed schedule uh, attached. The engineer, engineering committee discussed pipe construction techniques above glow, below grade, however, stopped short of recommending a technique, citing more information needed. It should be noted that a construction technique needs to be selected as soon as the tree removal is complete as formal bidding will be needed for helicopter services and material purchase. Uh, the pipe must be installed as soon as the pipe bench is reestablished to maintain the integrity of the pipe bench and trail uh, so the embankment would not ravel down and we'd have to go back and then reestablish the, the trail. Time will also be needed to obtain staffing to install the pipe which may not be as necessary today if the CCCs are, are willing to take on uh, uh, that portion of the uh, pipeline of the, the uh, pipeline installation. Attached are some background and the uh, Excel spreadsheet, which Jeff pointed out uh, some errors to that I hope we have corrected um, uh, on actual cost for above grade. Staff is asking tonight the recommendation that staff is uh, that the board review the memo, the cost estimate to replace the P-Line cross country pipeline above ground, and the engineering and committee recommendation to facilitate hazardous tree removal, reestablish of the pipeline trail, and environmental review. Okay. And with that, I hope I can answer any of your questions. Okay. Um, as chair of the engineering and environmental committee, I'd like to start with this item. Um, the committee uh, did uh, review the cost estimate uh, and recognized that this is something that uh, we've been asking uh, for for on the order of uh, eight months, 12 months. Uh, so to finally be able to have this uh, as the other portion of the information uh, that I thought we needed uh, is good. Uh, 
I'm, my recollection at the meeting was the additional information that we asked for and that I asked to be brought to the board was tell us what the next tasks would be, give us the, the uh, timing on those next tasks. We did talk about uh, construction methods above ground, below ground, but I don't remember uh, saying that uh, we were deferring um, on recommending a technique, citing more information needed. I don't remember what other information we were thinking of that we needed other than tell us what the other tasks are, tell us what the timing is, and that you've presented to us here. It's in the middle. That's correct. So um, I, I want to hear uh, also what other folks here on the board say, but in particular, I wanted to hear first from uh, Director Foltz, since he's also on the Engineering and Environmental Committee, um, so that we can uh, begin this discussion of, are we at a point of making a decision? So, uh, Bob. Yeah, um, th this is something that um, I think does require a little bit of, of um, a background here, because Unfortunately, there still seems to be a fair amount of um, information out there that doesn't accurately reflect what we talked about, uh, and including some things I saw on Facebook uh, recently. Um, the The discussion and conclusion that we reached at the committee was to uh, recommend to the board to take the next step of removing the trees and uh, uh, doing the environmental review and clearing the bench. It's important to note that a bench already exists for most of this pipeline. It's about a six to eight foot bench um, that that is already been cut out and that does need to be re restored in a few places, doesn't be, need to be cleared in a few places. But we did not um, recommend moving forward with a particular installation method given that the method that at least I've been talking about for quite a while that continues to, um, I guess, maybe not be well understood, is whether or not there's any possibility of being able to leverage um, hand digging or um, uh, embedding the pipe into the bench in a way that would allow us to get sufficient cover to be able to protect the pipe from the fire. Um, I think there was also a little bit of discussion about the fact that, you know, the trees were going to have to be re removed anyway, regardless of which way uh, the construction was going to go, and that it was well past time to get that activity done as soon as possible. In fact, it would have been better if it could have been done this, this past year. Um, so th that's my rec recollection of what we decided on at that committee meeting. Uh, hopefully that's reflected in the minutes. We did not recommend to the board to vote on uh, above ground or below ground or any particular installation of the pipe uh, at this time. Um, I believe there was going to also be an evaluation of the bench relative to whether or not there was a way to be able to um, uh, either hand dig or pull slough down or what have you over the pipe in a way to be able to give it sufficient ground cover. Uh, there, I have a whole series of questions around that that hopefully we'll be able to cover at a future um, uh, committee meeting. But but we didn't go into a lot of that, and that wasn't my recommendation. My recollection of the recommendation for the board: just the trees, just the bench, just the environmental. Okay. Um, and I agree that no, we did not uh, get to a point of recommending a method. We didn't talk um, in detail about that. Um, I don't believe that there was any commitment or discussion of uh, the further evaluation of hand digging, but um, that's something that, yes, Bob, I understand you like that discussed further. So um, with with that uh, background. Mark, Mark, Mark if, I, if I may, um, I believe that we owe the community that relative to some of the um, comments that were received in wake of the fire relative to the uh, pipe burning. Right. Okay. Um, 
So that's um, our recollections and reflections on that uh, committee meeting. Uh, so with what's in front of us here, uh, I wanted to hear the rest of the board's uh, questions uh, on this item. Um, so Jeff. So I'm looking at the recommended motion mm -hmm. and the recommended motion basically agrees with what Director Fultz said. Mm -hmm. um, it says move forward with the tree removal, reestablishment of the trail and environmental reviews. And then a phase two, which is to continue discussion in regards to burying the pipe and make a decision in the next couple of months as to what to do about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very much in agreement with what Director Fultz uh, was just saying. And I also personally am in an agreement with it. Um, there is a large amount in the, in, the, in the memo, there's a large amount of information on costs for equipment and, and, and uh, pipe and various accoutrements that would be required to work on the uh, building the pipeline itself. But I don't think we're being asked to, uh, I think that's that's almost a distraction at the moment because we're not being asked to vote on, on that stuff. So um, it, it's nice that we have that information, but I don't think it's essential to voting on the, uh, on the two motions here that are okay. included in the recommendation. Okay. Uh, Jamie? <clears throat> well, <coughs> I, I agree with what Jeff was saying. I, I would need to understand in the context of an environmental review, I mean, hand digging, uh, how deep would you have to go in order to protect a pipe from, from burning? That feels like, you know, you would just be doing something cosmetic, um, but I don't know. I'm not, you know, that would require environmental <laughs> review in order to make that kind of determination. Um, you know, I, I guess my primary question would be if we are moving forward um, with a, a plan to put this pipeline above ground, does that in any way foreclose us from choosing to underground the, you know, larger project if we so chose? I know there's already been, you know, some discussion at the board level about that, but, you know, would that, would, would we be creating any kind of a, a problem for ourselves down the road with the five mile project? Well, once the pipe would be in, I would say that you're committed. It, if p vine goes above ground, we're committed to oh no, also... What, when p vine goes above ground, you're not committed. Now, you may run into, this hypothetical, you may run into a problem with FEMA saying if you did it with one, why aren't you doing it with the other? Because this is substantially cheaper. You know, you could replace uh, from what we got from F&L's cost estimate of burying of 10, 12 million, you can replace that several times by putting it above ground. And you know, that was one of the parameters early on and that perimeter doesn't seem to be um, an issue right now, the cost. Um, I will say though, you know, Director Hill is 100% right. We, I listed the recommendation as the engineering committee requested or made the motion. But if you commit to the reestablishment of the trench, you need to very shortly commit to a technique, either above or below um, ground. You said reestablishment of the trench. Uh, of the trail, I'm sorry, of, of, the, of the bench. But if you commit to reestablishing the bench okay. and have the seas, you know, once we lock the seas in for a, a, a four month uh, stand, we need to be moving ahead with the piping because you've got procurement, formal bidding, you've got staffing, we may use the seas to do it, but it's not something you can just decide tomorrow what you're gonna do. So I would not recommend moving ahead with the, with the bench, not unless you had a technique or you thought you would come up with a conclusion a month down the road or two at the most, because you have a series of quite a few events that you have to do the plan. Right, and as well as the environmental review, we need to know what yeah. what direction we're going or we can't really review the project itself. So I can add that to that as well. Undergrounding is also a much longer construction process yeah. than going ahead with what were the proposed above ground installation. Mm -hmm. And you can't underground the, the full length of the pipe because there's no 
a bank there. It's in the air and you will be on telephone supports. And so that you would have to address that differently. That's where we go across ravine. And stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Jimmy, Gail? Um, I, I guess I have a different reaction to this. I, 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 did, I didn't find the motion very helpful for the reasons in part, for example, what Carly said is you, you can't do an environmental study until you know whether you're going in there and doing it by hand or whether you're going to have to establish a 12 foot wide bench that is got big uh, tractors going over it. Um, I guess my reaction is, is I think we have enough information in front of us to make a decision on this, the board. Um, you're asking about, do we know, you know, uh, how far we have to bury it? That that was in the study. That was the first one that FNL did. And it tells you exactly how deep you have to bury it before you get to temperatures that the HDPE won't melt or off gas. Um, I think the idea that you're going to go across and hand trench uh, something deep enough to protect an HDPE pipe in granite and metamorphic rocks is that you just, that it, it's not doable, right? Um, so to me, uh, my reaction to this is Rick has done everything we asked him to do, which is figure out how much it would cost to put it above ground, an HDPE pipeline. What he's shown is it's about one fifth the cost of what it would cost to bury it. Or the other way of putting it is as Margaret Bruce said it, you could replace that five times for the cost of putting it underground. But what also concerns me at least as much is the environmental damage that would go with burying and, uh, you know, and is the damage to the forest because the width of the bench that you'd have to put in to get that kind of machinery in to bury the pipe, um, I think most of our community will find unacceptable um, that live in the valley. Um, I also am concerned about whether uh, FEMA would reimburse us if we did it differently than it was there. I mean, that that's always a risk. Um, so, I mean, I would prefer that we just go ahead and make a decision. And I, I would offer an alternative motion to the ones that has been there, which is that we um, direct the interim district manager um, to begin replacement of the Peavine raw water supply line above grade with eight inch HDPE pipelines, starting immediately with hazardous tree removal, reestablishment of the pipeline trail, and the necessary environmental reviews, which you could do because you know what the scope of the project is. Okay. Um, I do see that Bob has his hand up. Before I ask uh, for comments or a second on that revised memo, uh, I'd like to hear from Bob. First, uh, uh, I just want to well, quick add to what she said on that motion is the also going and get you know pursuing contract with CCCs in that motion while we're doing this review and reviewing the trail for a contract with them because that's where we're looking to move forward with as well. Okay, you, you would want that language in yeah, yeah, because that's what we're trying to pursue right now. I think we had about today. And if that could be a motion, that would be great. That way we can move forward. Um, come back. We don't back. have to perfect we'll come back. We'll come back it. Let's, to that. I, yes. You know, maybe I'm the only but, one that thinks that. So, but so. I, 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 I <laughs> that would make it kind of moot. <laughs> right. We're talking about you know, how to implement what Gail's yeah. recommending. I want to hear from Bob. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so what we're talking about here is, in my opinion, dashing into a decision where we have, where we are still, in my in my opinion, not looking at this in a, a straightforward fashion. First of all, we've not asked, or if we've asked, we haven't worked with FEMA yet on figuring out what they will or won't pay. Given that what we're trying to do here is protect up to sixty percent of our water supply, so that the next time a fire comes through. We aren't dealing with um, the kind of issues that we were dealing with before. Um, I also want to remind people that that bench that's there was was carved out of the hillside, and in some places, 
the open space up against the uh, hillside is uh, up to four feet high. So saying that something can't be dug, um, I think is just, just not the case. Um, there's all sorts of techniques that you could use there. And in fact, Rick even talked about some of them during the meeting, which is one of the reasons why the committee came away with the notion of doing this in stages, which is tree first. It's going to take some time to get that down. And then you go in there and uh, do the bench and environmental. And in that time period, we would continue the discussion about whether or not it's feasible to be able to put this underground. Um, look, I understand that there is a, on the part of uh, the district manager, a high desire to get this done above ground. Um, but I don't believe, and we may have to do that for Clear Creek and um, Sweetwater just because of the terrain that's there. But I've not yet walked the entire path of Peavine. The part that I walked, I didn't necessarily see that there were places where we couldn't address uh, how to protect our water supply. And the last thing that I want to do is have a, a group of people similar to the group that we had during the uh, fire that we're reviewing why our pipeline was above ground to get burned. Um, yep, you might be able to replace it um, uh, again, but that's not the issue. The issue is how do you keep the water flowing uh, during that time? In addition, clearing the trees out is also going to give us um, additional protection that we talked about. Um, but I think it's way too premature at this point to just say, okay, uh, we're just going to go down the path of putting it above ground. Uh, we're not going to explore the hand dig option. I don't think, by the way, I don't think there's anybody at this point in time that looks at, at least I didn't hear anything in the committee, that looks at the notion of building a roadway to take equipment up there as anything practical or reasonable or anything that anybody wants to do. So from the point of view of comparing X and Y, X is no longer, at least in my mind, even a consideration. And it hasn't been actually from the time I saw the drawings and how wide that bench would have to be. Um, but I completely disagree with the fact that uh, hand digging is completely infeasible without doing a little bit more uh, diligence on our part to figure out whether or not that's true. That diligence has not been done because of the fact that there seems to be this push to just, hey, let's just put it above ground and be done with it. Um, I, I, we're, I, I will not support that. Of course, the rest of the board could vote to do that tonight. Um, I would not support it during the committee meeting. Um, and I think during the committee discussion, there is a pretty good consensus that came back and said, no, let's wait on that a bit. Let's get the tree removal done first. And then let's, in the meantime, let's talk about um, uh, the methods by which that would be done. I think Rick um, I, uh, reflected that pretty well in, in the motion of phase one and phase two. If the environmental review can't be started until that uh, further discussion has been done, then that's fine. Uh, but just because we passed the motion saying do this doesn't mean it's not going to be done in a reasonable uh, fashion and, and staged as you go along, starting with the trees. Um, so that's why I would oppose what Gail is proposing. Um, and I think our community would want to make sure that we're looking at all options to protect our water in the event of the next fire, which I don't believe we have done at this point. Okay. Um, well, since the uh, question of hand digging is coming up in this discussion, I do want to reflect on that. Um, I walked a good portion of the Peavine uh, alignment along with Director Foltz uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, as a licensed professional geologist, I want to say the, uh, the possibility, in my mind, of hand digging that is not feasible. I was walking on um, rock, competent enough rock um, along portions of that line that says, uh, I'm going to be hitting bedrock within the next several inches. Uh, there were areas that we didn't walk on where I could see it diving into the creek where it was on competent rock. Um, so for, for that reason and the uh, feasibility of trying to hand dig 
a mile. Uh, I don't. I, I'm rolling that out completely with, without having to go out there and do hand dug test pits uh, in these uh, areas. And I don't doubt that you could dig uh, limit, very limited areas, but we need to, if we did this, we need to go look at the hardest areas first, because in those hardest areas where you're going to have to get through in order to make the whole thing feasible. So um, with that, uh, uh, before we uh, opinion on the on the motion. Uh, okay. Can I just add sure. to what Bob was saying? I, you know, I'm wondering if maybe we're just getting a little bit hung up here on on the semantics of it, because um, it's not that um, I'm not interested in doing anything to fire harden the HDPE line. I mean, I think there are things we, we can do. For example, um, there might be places where you purposely let the, the uh, face of the bench slough over. Right. And so in other words, you get uh, 12 inches of coverage just naturally. There might be some places where you could um, hand dig it. I don't think there's going to be very many, but there's some where you might be able to do that. So I guess what I, I would say is I, I consider both those ideas that it's essentially above grade. We're not going to go in with big machinery trying to bury everything underground. And so Actually, when I wrote this, I wrote it as two, two parts. One would be that we agree to move ahead with the principle that it's largely above grade, but we would also investigate other things um, like letting it slough down uh, and installing video monitoring and automatic emergency cutoff valves and so that we could do some things that um, would you know, at least protect portions. But, you know, one of the problems when you're dealing with HDPE is that um, if it burns, the gases go places, right? And so, um, you know, that's, I think that's one of the reasons Rick said, you know, burying parts of it doesn't um, really oh, no. solve the whole thing. But it could help if you got lucky that it just happened, the fire just happened to go through, you know, it was a smaller fire, it wasn't as horrible as CZU, and it just happened to go through an area that you had done something to ameliorate it by letting the slope slough or whatever. So it's not that I, I don't want to do anything. I just think that given the cost differential, the difficulties, the environmental impact, and then what Rick said, which I hadn't really thought of or thought clearly, was that once you do that bench, you have to go in and start the work right away. Because it, you know, if you rate, wait one rainy season, one atmospheric river, it's it's you're starting all over. So uh, this is why, you know, between the environmental study and that, I, I don't see how you can stage this. It, it, you know, this has to be a decision one, one way or another. Um, and so it, it's really not, to, to me, it's the, the principle that we're putting it essentially largely above, above grade and there might, and we're gonna do what we can locally to uh, fire harden it. Um, but the idea of, of digging a mile, more than a mile long hand dug trench across metamorphic and granitic rocks is just not, not gonna work. Yeah, okay. How was the bench dug to begin with in metamorphic rock? Um, there's enough uh, loose cover in the first uh, several inches um, to a foot out there that they were able to cut the bench into that. But some, some, of, the, some of those faces but, are, are much uh, higher. Uh, than let, let me finish. Um, but as you go deeper than that, um, in most of the areas, I was walking on reasonably competent, uh, not bedrock, but reasonably competent rock, which is telling me I'm going to get to bedrock fairly soon under under where I'm walking. Yeah, yeah, Mark. I mean, we we were walking on a place where the faces on the cut for the bench were anywhere from two to four feet high. Right. Yeah, that's where the supports were built. But I, I, I mean, you're already digging. You're already digging in rock. 
uh, to create that bench. And especially since the bench was anywhere from four to, in some places, six to eight feet wide. Those areas were not benched. Those were on supports, right? I well, like I say, I like retaining us. Um, no. So I um we have uh the motion uh as written that's been put in front of us. Uh we've had uh an amended motion that Gail has put out. Well, I haven't um, fully said it, but I could. Uh, but, well, we have <laughs> yeah, we have yeah. the thoughts of it. Yeah, the thoughts of it. We That's have right. the thoughts of it. Uh, rather than the full thing at this point, um, in my opinion, we either approve and we've requested this portion already, the hazardous tree removal. I, I thought at a previous board meeting we said bring us the cost for the hazardous tree removal. Yeah. So that we could, we don't need to do that. So that we could do that. So that I think is already uh, give us the cost for that. I think the rest of this reestablish the trail, uh, do the environmental review, and decide on the method. I think that's all together. Yeah, because and you're pointing out to us, Rick. Well, we need to be uh, prepared. If we reestablish the trail, we're ready to go that method. If we reestablish the trail by hand with the CCC crews, and we conclude that we don't want to put this back on top of the ground, did we then spend whatever the money is for the CCC crews uh, and not utilizing it? correctly because we don't need the trail then if we're going to use equipment or similar to yeah. to go do that so i think i think you know establish the trail. changes you know i think if you could i think anything that you do over the trees you need to do it all or none because right you know i don't right we can't seem to move quick enough to get this information and i don't know you know how far we'll keep going on different methods and it'll take us we'll right. blow this year and if we the seas are out three to six months or at least six months out yeah. so this stuff takes scheduling um, yes and to get yeah. that information for the board to make another decision of different techniques i think you know that you probably would forget this construction season next year yeah okay. and i and i would recommend it you know there's a lot of water up there you know it's kind of when I saw it today for the first time, um, uh, we need that water. Um, it's um, time. Right. We don't debate that, yes, we want to get uh, that surface water source uh, back in production. Uh, right. Call the board. Everybody, everybody on the board agrees with that. We're still uh, not of the same opinion on how we get that pipe there how we put it in place. Um, so uh, I want to, you've, you've heard from Bob a couple of times, Gail, and both and me several times. Um, I want to know if either Jeff or Jamie have anything else to reflect. Uh, otherwise I'm going to solicit from the, from the public and then come back uh, to this. So, we don't have a seconded motion on the floor yet. We right. don't. Um, I um, wanted to see what other yeah. comments we have before we do that. So where I'm getting to on this is that we either decide to go forward with above ground or we decide to go forward with tree removal and come back to above ground versus buried at a future meeting. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anything in between that because if we go beyond tree removal, uh, then, then we continue to push out the other decision, um, doing the bench work and stuff like that is, is pointless if we're gonna get into winter. And so we either approve the tree removal tonight or we approve all the way through to uh, doing it above ground. And right. I, I don't think, I don't know if we're ready to do that or not. Right. And that's what I'm trying to get a sense of. Yeah. Uh, and uh, 
we see from the schedule when Rick anticipates that we would be able to do these things, tree removal, February. Yeah. Um, really tough to do up there in February. Um, well, obviously weather permitting a lot of yeah, right. I mean, with, yeah. with bench, uh, reestablishing the bench June. Yeah. So, um, Jamie. Well, I just wanted to follow up on, so, you know, I, first of all, agree with, uh, the direction that Gail is moving in, to be honest with you, I felt like we needed to give staff some more direction about this for a while now. Um, but I wanted to, you know, I, I think that what Carly said was important that, that they need that direction from us in order to pursue any kind of environmental review. Mm -hmm. And without that environmental review, these questions that we have can't get answered. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel like at some point we have to make the hard decision and, you know, allow staff mm -hmm. to move forward on this. Okay. The, um, so I, I heard you say that you wanted to be honest with us, and yes, you're agreeing with, yeah. with what Gail is, is thinking I, or yeah. suggesting as far as a, as a motion here. Okay. Again, before we uh, put the motion out there, and I, I wanted to see uh, from the public uh, comments on what we've been discussing here. So, um, from those that are in attendance here, uh, please. Eric Martin from Boulder Creek. Uh, what I'm hearing here is a series of questions that kind of interlock together. Um, you're talking about above ground versus below ground. You've got geology. I'm sure somebody can find somebody from the dirt people community that can go out there and get some topography and let us know what's underneath that. That's one. Hazardous tree, remo tree removal means one or two things. One, you're going to remove them out by truck. Two, you're going to remove them out by helicopter. Or three, you're going to lay them on the ground. You put your plastic pipe on the ground and you got a bunch of hazardous tree debris on the ground and that catches on fire, that just exacerbates the problem. So we're looking at this, this pipeline as being a, for the most part, by definition, a temporary installation. Because unless you send crews out there every season to clear all the brush and all the, all the flammable debris away from the pipeline, we're going to be right back in the same boat that we're in. Mm. If there hasn't been a geological study on the, the proposed path, you're not going to hand dig it. I've been up in these mountains for 40 years. You're you hand digging that stuff, you, we'll, we'll be looking for water long after we're gone. So you're going to have to bring, if you're going to remove the trees, Either helicopter, clean footprint. You're gonna move trucks because trees aren't light. I was working on trees all day today. They're not light. So you're now you're talking at the minimum small construction equipment. A four foot road, probably not gonna make it. You're gonna need six or eight, depending on how tight the turns are. Then you've got to get the logs on the trucks, then you gotta get those hauled out. That's not an eight foot road, that's a 10 to 12 foot road. So you got a whole bunch of things that are all tying together. And knowing what you're gonna do either above ground or below ground, that's going to determine how all of this other stuff goes. Because if you don't create a clear fire break around your fire, around your raw water lines, this is just the whole thing starting all over again. And that the district is going to have to pay to have those areas continually cleared, just like we all do. And so determining what you're going to do based on what we're just talking about, whether we're going to decide above ground or below ground, and then make the, the facts fit the scenario seems somewhat backwards. It would seem to me that you would want to know what's underneath the ground that's going to limit your ability to, A, move those trees out, unless you're using helicopters. I really don't want you spending my money on helicopters, because I don't know what those costs. Not unless you absolutely have to. But moving hazardous trees with helicopters, there's no return on that. You're going to pay somebody to haul them away. You're paying somebody to pluck them out of the, out of the ground or off the ground and put them in a truck. It just seems to me you need to do the fundamentals of decide the geography first and the geology, and then base your decisions on that and accept the fact that it may not be feasible to put it underneath the ground, then it's gonna be a temporary installation with the required maintenance that goes with it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Rick Moran from Ben Lundin. Thank you. Um, I have a continued concern about this issue. I was on the board when the fire happened. Uh, it was devastating to all of us, and I still carry some of those scars associated with it. Um, but I want to be able to say to future generations that we did something to improve uh, this risks that are up there. We all know we live with risks, but we did something to improve these risks. And I want to refer to um, the FML uh, peer review statement back in 2022. Um, and it says, uh, for recommend recommendations for the next phase, that's point five. Mechanisms and protocols to isolate areas of the pipeline and shut down the district's water treatment plant might help minimize risk associated with fire damage to the water system. That's what I'm trying to focus on, all right? I have previously suggested that the pipeline have a few isolation valves to try and prevent a total loss of the pipe. I'm particularly concerned that a valve at the intake side of the lion's tank be fire hardened and have redundancy. So if you know, I served on a submarine and for three years I slept in a bunk that was this far away from a great big valve that was the emergency ballast tank operation valve, very important valve, right? That was right there. That valve had redundancy to be operated uh, remotely, could operate it locally by pushing a solenoid, and it could be operated manually. I think those the valves that we choose to use here need to have that kind of redundancy, right? Also, our fire management plan should include a maintenance schedule, agreeing with the previous speaker here, um, include a maintenance schedule for monitoring the fire potential along the pipeline. I just want to clarify to people here, my understanding is uh, listening to the environmental, we're not talking about tree removal. The plan was to tree, to cut the trees down and leave them there. So um, we don't have to, we're not trying to worry about that cost of helicoptering them out or other kinds of removal. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anybody who's attending remotely uh, wish to comment, ask questions on this? Um, if not, uh, I do want to reflect on both of the uh, speakers uh, here. Um, one on the tree removal or uh, cutting down the hazardous uh, trees. Uh, Rick or Carly, what are the thoughts or recommendations from our, uh, is it the licensed forester? I think it'd be most. That, that we have, yeah. What? Just to, to leave in place, cut and lop, and what do they call it? Lop and scatter. Lop and, lop and scatter. You know, they're already in the forest, so they would cut them, and we would make sure they were cut off the trail and right. far, far enough away so they wouldn't, you know, add to fuel. Okay. Um, that's for sure, yes. Okay. Um, and to the uh, suggestions of uh, either isolation valves, uh, other aspects, I think I've heard similar from... Uh, from Gail and what she was suggesting. So incorporating that into uh, something. Uh, right. So Well, and, and we thought about, you know, and, and there will be isolation valves. And just to be a, a clear point, during the CZU fire, um, the director of operations, James, worked with our fire management group on uh, infrared uh, satellite heat maps. And they, they they followed the fire and they did shut down the treatment plant and did isolate. You know, isolation valves could be used. Uh, and now, you know, cellular capabilities and remote uh, automation is getting better and better. We could have isolation valves um, in the field. And even if it was above ground, they could isolate in those sections of Maine. Amazing. That would not have saved any of this pipeline in this fire we had. No, it wouldn't have. Uh, yes. The yeah. fire went over the entire length yeah. of the pipeline there. Right. So any isolation valve out in the field was irrelevant. At that, so yeah. that part. Where we well, shut it down at the treatment plant, right. we saved the water system, the actual distribution system itself, right. by not getting contaminated by doing so. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that, that we put isolation valves in. I think what I'm hearing is 
um, go back and think about what other protection measures, either uh, if isolation valves or other fire uh, fire hardening or you know, maintenance along the line, or there should be things that have uh, that technology brings us in the how many years, Rick? 1984, 85. When when we put this in before, um, um, that in the last 40 years that have been developed that would better be able to service for above ground HDPE. If you know, that's I, the way, I, I agree with you, Mark. But those technologies need to be used to keep the fire starting. Because once the fire got on that watershed. I, Okay. It, okay. There was no access. They didn't use aerial. If I'm not going to critique the fire. If staff, but. If staff concludes, though, that there's no point. That, 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 that there is that there yeah. is not. We're not saying Invest do it. Just but no isolation valves are good for maintenance just, and for, for just multiple reasons. Just look at um, so and we would have them, uh, and that's AWWA spec. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I, but I don't want to try to design that. All right. I wanted to point out is we're hearing a suggestion yeah. from a uh, former director. Consider that. Sure. I no, think and, I'm and hearing from Gail. Yeah. Consider yeah. other yeah. technology yeah. aspects. But, if, but, if it benefits the line, we're not saying do any of this. I'm, I'm yeah, finding the discussion in the audience distracting. So if we could hold off on yeah. audience discussion, but, please. You know, there was, uh, yeah. Okay. Inflation valves are a good thing to have. Okay. On a pipeline okay. period for multiple reasons. But, yes. you know. <laughs> I wish Cal Fire and the rest of them, and they must be doing something so that type of fire but doesn't happen. But we're yeah. not saying do that. Right. We're saying consider other techniques that may not have been available in 1984, 85 when this got put in place. Gotcha. Given the fact that we know it's going to burn up there again, we don't know when. So, okay. Um, I've heard nothing else uh, than I think we need to consider. Uh, you know? You put. You said you didn't read what you wanted for a motion. Well, so. I, I, yeah, I had two parts. One would be the first is move that the board directs the interim general manager to begin replacement of the Pevine raw water supply line above grade with eight inch HDPE pipeline, starting immediately with hazardous tree removal, reestablishment of the pipeline trail, and necessary environmental review. The second part would be move that while this work is underway, the board directs the GM, general manager, and the environmental, excuse me, engineering and environmental committee to explore ways in which an above grade HDPE pipeline could be made more resilient in case of wildfire. And I I could list a bunch of things, but I don't think I need to put those in a, a motion, but they would include right. things like allowing material to slough over um, over the pipe so it's covered locally. Video uh, video monitoring where you might have cameras up there that are telemetered right. in, uh, automatic um, shutoff valves. The other thing is, you know, earthquakes. But, Maybe you'd want something triggered by ground motion. Uh, Mud slides. But I, I don't yeah, think, again, I, mean, I don't yeah. think we need to go. But that doesn't need to go in there. I right. think that's and for the committee to, to decide. Value. Exactly. Yeah. That's what that's what the instruction is. So let me just say that okay. again. That is could is to direct the general manager and the E and E committee to explore ways in which an above grade HDP pipeline could be made more resilient in case of wildfire. Okay. I would second that motion. Um, I'm compelled by the idea that. Order? Okay. Point it, is that one motion or two? Um, I, I, I'm happy to have that divisible if you want, Bob. That, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the first motion then. So we would vote on them separately. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, so, I would so. still second the, the initial motion. I'm compelled by the idea that, well, I, I want to fire harden this in any way that we can. Um, I think that the, the likelihood that we will have landslides that affect this pipe and if it's underground become even more challenging to address over time is, is um, you know, probably more likely than, you know, a, a another CZU level fire 
in the near term. So I second the um, initial motion uh, that Gail has made. Okay. We have a motion out in front of us, Holly. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director <coughs> Mayhood. Yes. Director Falls. No. Okay. So, Would you like me to read the second motion again and uh, for a second? So, because we need a second on that. Please. Okay. Yes. Move that while this work is underway, the board directs the general manager and the AE committee to explore ways in which an above grade HDPE pipeline could be made more resilient in case of wildfire. Okay. Second. Okay. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Okay. Um, concluded on that item. Uh, we'd now like to uh, move to the discussion of the rate study. So he's got his marching orders. <laughs> um, the 2023 rate study. Excuse uh, me, just one moment. Sure. Can I ask um, uh, CTB to please uh, make panelists of, um, uh, let me see all the names that I have here, Teresa Juratich and and Heather Paul Epilenti, would you please make both of those people panelists, please? And oh, and Melissa Elliott as well. Thank you. Good evening, directors. Uh, Teresa Juratich also. Thank you, CTV. Thank you, Chair. Excuse me. Okay. Are we? I just wanted to make sure everybody moved, that needs to speak. The, the individuals <laughs> over uh, that need to be panelists. That's so, correct. So Jamie has. Yeah. Right. Here from one, and right. I'm going to also. <laughs> uh, we can we can continue. I'll leave, uh, yes, uh, take breaks as needed. Okay. Um, the next item is the uh, continued discussion on the uh, utility rate study. Uh, Rick, uh, who's I'm going to ask: Is Heather on the call? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm going to ask Heather to take the lead on this one. I've got it. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Directors. I'm Heather I. Paletti, Senior Advisor with Regional Government Services, serving in the role of Interim Director of Finance. As a way of introduction, on October 5th, the Board of Directors adopted the financial plans. The adoption of the financial plans was an important step. That information has been used to develop the rate structure. The first two years of the financial plans are essentially the board approved budget. On October 23rd, six rate options were presented to the Finance and Budget Committee. The committee unanimously voted in favor of one option a 45% fixed three tiered rate with an expansion of the low income rate assistance program. A couple of items have changed since that last presentation. The private fire rate was slightly revised for accuracy, and the sewer rates were increased in the later years to agree with the water inflation assumptions where the first two years agree with the board approved budget. The rate presentation changed many times this week. We received a significant amount of input, and our goal was to make the presentation as accurate and clear as possible. We are not asking for adoption tonight. The board and public will have additional opportunity to comment on the proposed rates before staff asks the board to accept the rates. 
In summary, the plan is to come back to the board on November 16th with a motion accepting the proposed rate structures and directing staff to prepare and mail, as required by law, a notice of public hearing on the proposed water and wastewater rates with a public hearing to be held on January 18th, 2024. And with that introduction, I'll turn the presentation over to Teresa from RAF TELUS. Thank you. Good evening, board. Thank you for having us back uh, to talk to you about the rates. Um, just a refresher of where we are in the process. We're about halfway through. Um, we've been through the financial planning, as Heather mentioned, and then we've been working with district staff to um, develop the cost of service and prepare um, proposed rates for your consideration. Um, once we get through that process, um, we would be looking for um, board, board authorization um, at the next meeting and then uh, moving through the process with the Prop 218 mailing and then the public hearing. So as a reminder, the selected financial plan for your water enterprise was to do overall revenue adjustments of uh, two years of 10% followed by three years of 7% per year. Um, as a reminder, this is the overall rate-based revenue adjustment. Um, individual bill changes will increase less or more than the overall percentage adjustment based on the water structure that gets adopted and the amount of water used as well as your meter size. So just a quick reminder on the cost of service. Um, this is a method where we uh, recover costs. We allocate costs between fixed charges, your fixed monthly bill and your variable rates. So what changes based on how much water you use. And then this is, we also look at how to, how the customer classes use water and place demands on the system and allocate um, costs accordingly to those different customer classes. And this methodology follows industry standard best practices by the American Water Works Association and the Water Environment Federation. Um, so I, the, as we do our cost allocation, we have um, some major main cost components. Um, the one that I'll bring your attention to is the peaking cost. Um, that's where we're looking at how uh, the different customer classes peak and place those demands on your on your system. Um, um, so, in terms of, of looking at peaking, do we need to let uh, Alina we, we know that we can hear her? And <laughs> some somebody we can hear having a personal discussion. <laughs> Um, so this this graphic kind of is to give you sort of an idea of what um, the the impact is on on peaking. So the this is uh, imagine these are pipe diameters for your your water system. Um, your average day you could see there um, your maximum day and then your max hours. So you need to you know size your system or your pipe um, a lot larger. Why did that do that? Um, a lot larger to meet your um, your peak hour demand than you would if you only had to size it to meet your average day. And you'd have a similar comparison, you know, for your storage tanks, um, et cetera. So that's why it's important for us to look at those type costs. Hmm. Um, so uh, this slide is looking at the cost of service alignment. So what we looked at is um, removing the proposed 10% Revenue overall revenue adjustment for the test year, we say, how are the customer classes currently recovering costs um, based on the cost of service analysis? So you'll see the customer classes there in the first column. Um, and then we calculate the revenue that is um, generated by those different customer classes under the current rates. And then based on our cost of service analysis, we say, what revenue should they be recovering? Um, and then you can see from the graphic here that the industrial and, I'm sorry, the plus and minus signs are off a little, off a little bit there. The commercial and industrial 
um, customers are slightly over collecting what they should be. And the single family irrigation, hauled water and private fire service customers are under, rec under recovering. So what this is telling us is in addition to the overall revenue adjustment that's needed, um, we also need to realign and um, redistribute those costs to the customer classes so that um, we are meeting equity and um, requirements. Um, so as a reminder- Can I ask you to pause for a second? There's someone on the line who's having a conversation at home and we can hear you. If you wouldn't mind, please muting your phones you're, if, you're, if you're on the phone so that we can really hear uh, Heather giving her presentation. That would be great, thank you. Can't you vote them? Okay. Okay, go ahead, please. I'm sorry about that. That's okay, thank you. Um, so as a refresher, um, from our earlier rates 101 conversation back in the summer, um, three priorities for the district um, came out of that discussion. Um, revenue stability, affordability, and conservation. And so we kept these priorities in mind as we were developing alternative um, a water rate schedule. Um, we do want to note that you know an increase in revenue stability is, is met by increasing your fixed charges. And that has a an impact on your lower than average water uses. It, it impacts them more than it does your higher water usage. So that kind of is a little bit in contrast with the affordability potentially. Um, but we then address affordability through the tiered residential water rates, um, as well as a proposed increase in the low income rate assistance benefit. Um, and then the tiered rates also, as well as the customer class, um, proposed customer class rates that you'll be seeing here, those help address the or address conservation. Um, the district does um, seem to have a, a pretty good conservation program and uh, low water, lower average water use in the single family um, class than we might see in, in um, some of our other customers. Um, so uh, it looks like the program has you know, been going well and this, this will just sort of further those efforts. Um, so when we went to the Budget and Finance Committee, uh, they kind of kept in mind as we were looking at the alternatives that each alternative recovered the same amount of revenue that, that was determined in the financial plan, but that each alternative has a different impact on the customers depending on water usage, meter size, and customer class. So your current water rate structure, um, there's a monthly service charge, and then there's a volumetric charge, and all customers um, pay a uniform rate, a dollar per a dollar per CCF unit rate, and then there's a separate uniform rate for your hauled waste customers. And currently, about 31% of your rate-based revenue comes from that fixed charge. The rest, the rest comes from the volumetric charges. Um, and then the graph on the right shows you a breakout of your revenue sources. So you can see that your rate-based revenue is over 80% of your revenue sources. So we, um, in reviewing the water rate structures, we first looked at the fixed charges. So we looked at, um, do we want to look at uh, um, a 35% uh, recovery of the, of the fixed charges, the revised cost of service and where costs are falling, um, it would automatically uh, increase your fixed charge recovery uh, to 35%. Um, and then we also looked at if we increase that even further to 45% to help address the priority of revenue stability. Um, we've also created a capital specific fixed charge to recover capital related costs and provide greater clarity and visibility into um, what, what your, the build, the, your, build, your bills are, are going towards, like how, you know, what, so that there's more transparency on the bills for customers to understand what, what's going towards what to pay, to pay for what. Excuse me. Um, and then we also created a private fire service fixed charge for those customers that receive this special service. Um, on the volumetric side, we evaluated three options. The first one is the current structure that you have. The second one looked at creating a three tier structure for single family residential and then uniform rates 
by customer class with three new customer classes, commercial, industrial, and irrigation. And then we also um, looked at a third option um, that looked at a two-tier structure for single family. So after reviewing the, those rates and the impacts on them, the committee um, recommended uh, going, going with the, the three fixed charges we talked about, the monthly service charge, the capital charge, and then the private fire service that would only impact those 87 customers that have that service. And then increasing uh, the charges such that your recovery, um, that 45% of your rate-based revenue would be uh, come from fixed charges. And then on the volumetric side, uh, we went with the three-tier single-family residential. So the first tier is for usage up to four CCF, that's 100 cubic feet. Um, 100 cubic feet is 748 gallons. Um, that four CCF is based on the lowest average winter month. That's a um, typical method for helping to set tiers. The second tier would be for usage um, over four and up to eight CCF. And that top of that tier is based on your highest average summer month. And then anything over eight uh, would fall into the third tier. And then, as I mentioned before, we have a uniform uh, rates for cus by customer class for three new customer classes, and then maintaining, um, continuing having a separate uniform rate for the hauled water. Uh, the committee's rationale for choosing this rate structure um, is that you know the higher fixed cost recovery uh, results in more revenue stability to help with weather droughts, to help weather droughts and emergencies. Um, creating the different water rate structures, water classes, corrects the inequities that we saw on that earlier slide um, that you have under a current uniform rate for everyone. Then creating the tiers for the single family residential customers helps pa pass along the higher cost associated with peaking to those users that place the peaking, peaking demands on the system and then keep pass along the lower cost to those customers that use less water and don't place peaking demands on the system. Um, option, the option two, the three tier option was selected um, because the option one, which was the un maintaining the uniform rate for everybody impacts the lower water usage more strongly than either options two or three. And then um, while options two and three, the results were similar, the three-tier option provided a lower volumetric rate for the low water usage customers and a higher rate for the largest users. Um, so before we go in and I show you kind of the rate derivation and the proposed rate schedules, um, the components of the water bill would now consist of the monthly service charge plus the monthly capital charge plus the volumetric charge. And then for those 87 or so customers that have private, private fire service, they would also see a charge for that private, private fire service. So this is um, how we come up with these with the new service charge. Um, the main components of that are a meter charge and a customer charge. The meter charge uh, varies based on meter size because uh, costs increase as you are maintaining those larger meters. The, the larger meters themselves cost more than the smaller meters, et cetera. So it's reflecting those costs. And then we also have the customer cost, which captures costs related to billing, customer service, et cetera. And that does not vary by meter size. And we add those two together to get the new proposed charge for the service charge. And then on the capital charge, this is recovering any of the, or all of the capital related costs that have been identified in the financial plan. And those are allocated out based on uh, the meter capacity ratio um, because of the, the greater impact that the larger meters place on the system. So that's why we use the meter capacity ratio for those charges. Um, the private fire service charge, this is also an, a new charge. Um, we allocated costs to that based on uh, fire capacity needs. And um, these are ratioed based on uh, fire demand uh, ratios. 
and you can see the proposed charges there. Now we move on to the volumetric side. This graph is showing you the cumulative single family build usage. So if you're looking at this, you would see, if you look at the two CCF on the, on the bottom, on the horizontal axis there, what it's telling you is that bills up through two CCF per month account for a little over 20% of the annual usage from the single family customers. This is about um, a tenth, uh, the 10th percentile for those in the audience that um, are statisticians. Um, for CCF, is uh, equal to the median usage, and it's also that average low winter month, um, and is the top of tier one. For reference, the six CCF is the average usage across the entire class, across all of the bills for an entire year. The eight CCF is that average high month that we're using for the top of tier two. And then um, CCF would be kind of the equivalent to the two CCF, that's the 90th percentile. So for the volumetric charge, it's composed of a base plus peaking plus conservation component. The base component is capturing um, the cost related to average, delivering average supply um, to, to all of your customers. So that cost stays the same for all of your customers. The peaking cost is where we take those max day and max hour costs that we identified and we distribute them between the customer classes and to each of the tiers based on the characteristics of the peaking usage within those classes or tiers. So that's why you see that um, varying between the three different tiers within single family and then for each of the customer classes. And then the conservation charge, the conservation component is applied to across all of the customers because the, um, the district Mess messaging is for is for all the customers. Um, so we apply it equally to, to everyone. And if you sum those three components across for each line, you get the proposed volumetric charge for each of the customer classes or tiers. So you can see that for tiers one and two in single family, that those would actually be a lowering from the current volumetric charge. Uh, for the customers, and that for tier three, it would be an increase. You can also see that um, commercial is and industrial are decreasing, reflecting that they are, um, that cost of service was um, showing that they're kind of over collecting. So we're doing a, a course correction for them. And then irrigation and hauled water um, increases are going up um, commensurate with their cost of service. So this um, shows the proposed schedule for the two fixed charges, this monthly service charge and that new monthly capital charge. So you can see um, out through the five years, the proposed fiscal year 2024 charges are based on the cost of service analysis that we've done for fiscal year 2024. The subsequent years are um, based on the prior year times the revenue adjustment. So fiscal year 2025, is the fiscal year 2024 times that 10% revenue adjustment because we've done the cost of service realignment in the first year. Um, here you can see the projection for the fire service charge. So again, the derived charge for fiscal year 2024 based on cost of service, and then the escalated um, charges based on the overall revenue adjustment. And then similarly for the volumetric charge, you can see the current charge there, and then the proposed charges for the five years. And then this is a, a chart of the single family bill impacts. I will note that the sample bills do not include the fire recovery surcharge since that surcharge is not going to change. Um, we did not include it in this analysis. Um, so this is just looking at what, what, is, what is changing. So you can see um, at the various usage levels, I will note that for the three, the three usage levels on the left, the 16, 26, and 46 CCF, usage above about 15 CCF accounts for about 5% of the bills 
um, in the single family uh, customer class annually. So about 5% of the monthly bills um, are for usage at, at amounts greater than 15 CCF in a month. Um, in addition to this, the Budget and Finance Committee recommended an increase to the Low Income Rate Assistance Program and that it be implemented at the same time as the new structure. Currently, there are 78 households en enrolled and they receive a $10 per month reduction in their bill. Um, a possible change would be to in increase this reduction to $15 per month when the new rates for fiscal year 2024 go into effect and then increase it to $20 per month in fiscal year 2025. And then uh, lastly, on the water side of things, this is a comparison um, of the single family bill for that, that average six CCF per month bill with a five eight inch meter um, against some of your, some of your neighbors. Um, I will note that Soquel Creek is in the middle of doing their rate study. So we don't have their proposed fiscal year 2024 rates. So this is based on their current um, 2023 rates that are in effect. So you can kind of see where um, the district uh, would land with the proposed 2024 rates um, comparatively for this size meter and usage. And then on the wastewater side, uh, we have revenue adjustments uh, following along with the um, anticipated increase in O&M from year to year. And then you can also see the proposed charge per month. Since uh, these charges are on a fixed monthly basis and they go to all single family homes, there's no cost of service differential here. So the revenue adjustment is directly applied to the rate to come up with the new proposed rates. And then lastly, just reviewing the schedule for ad adopting the water and wastewater rates. This is based on having rates implemented on February 1st. Um, we have tonight's uh, initial discussion with the board and then a plan to come back in two weeks at the November 16th meeting to hopefully receive authorization to move forward with the rates and doing the Prop 218 notice, um, getting that mailed out by December 1st, and then having a public hearing on January 28th. Thank you very much for having us back here this evening to share this with you. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, Heather, do you have anything you want to comment or add to this or shall I solicit questions? Um, let me just add one little piece. Teresa, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Um, there will be a, um, I wanna say the administrative committee um, Carly, please check me if I'm wrong, but um, the committee is meeting on Friday tomorrow to discuss the public outreach reach portion of, of this um, plan so so that they're ready to go and we'll, we'll, we'll know more about that after Friday's meeting. But that is all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, get uh, comments from the budget and come up. Budget and Finance Committee uh, members first on the board. As a, Jeff had his hand up. Oh, okay. Oh, Jeff, I, I just had a quick note here on the slide about components of the water bill. Since we have not, <coughs> excuse me, I had a frog in my throat here. Um, since we still have the fire surcharge, uh, that probably ought to be listed there on that slide that the fire surcharge will be there until it uh, ends as scheduled. Okay, so, okay. Uh, any, since you're speaking so as member we, of the- What we saw here is in, in alignment with what we were discussing in the Budget and Finance Committee. And uh, I, I'll defer to Gail on uh, any comments she may have. It, it's in alignment with what the committee said. Was okay, and what the committee, what the committee agreed on. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I guess um, what I would say is that this anybody looking at those tables will say this is painful. 
<laughs> um, you know, that, that we're going to have to increase rates, but we really don't have any choice. If we're going to bring the district into financial stability and get us to the situation where we can uh, both get our um, reserves to appropriate levels and can complete all the capital projects and improvements that we need to on our infrastructure. But I think that um, the Budget and Finance Committee worked hard to figure out a way to um, do this in a way that had the least impact um, on the lower income folks in the Valley um, and that also produced um, a greater reliability in terms of our uh, revenues. And we did that by increasing the fixed portion of the rates from its current 31% to 45%. And the rates are going up, but the impact for low and moderate users is relatively small. And um, the largest impact is going to the high water use folks. And we've done that by imposing very steeply tiered rates across the three tiers. So that's all I'll say. Okay. All right. Jamie? Um, I... I I am, you know, in support of the direction we're moving with the rates, not because I like what we're proposing to do here, because I agree it's painful, but, um, you know, I, I have worked uh, for other water utilities. Um, the imbalance of volumetric and fixed charges is always a problem because our costs are in the fixed charges. Um, that's, you know, the, the largest percentage of our budget is fixed and, and the volumetric charges um, you know, the more we can do to balance those two pieces of the rate, the, the more stability we will have long term. So I appreciate seeing that. Um, my concern is, and I'm going to be a bit of a fly in the ointment here, the timing of things. Um, we, uh, I think this is the first time we as a board are seeing what the rates will look like. And of course, it's the first time that the public has an opportunity to see what the rates will look like. I think that we need to have at least one public meeting before we as a board uh, pass the rate authorization in order to take public feedback on what is being proposed here. And unfortunately, given the timing, we would be authorizing these rates at our next meeting and starting the Prop 218 process. And I don't think that we'll have had an opportunity at that point to have had some sort of a public outreach meeting to, to, to more broadly socialize what we are discussing here. So I, I recognize that we're under, you know, a very tight time frame because of, you know, the, 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 the budgetary issues that we are facing next year. But I wonder if we could consider pushing the board rate authorization to our December meeting so that we could at least try to have some sort of a public outreach meeting to, to you know, collect some more feedback before we actually authorize these rates and start the Prop 218 process. I will say that our neighbors who are going through a rate study right now, SoCal, they're not even having their public he hearing until next February, and they are already collecting feedback and doing some pretty significant public outreach. So I feel like it's a bit of a uh, you know, missed opportunity here if we don't have a little bit more time in the schedule. Um, and that's kind of where my concern is at about this. Okay. All right. Uh, Bob? I'd like to hear from you. Yeah, I have a few questions that uh, hopefully will uh, clarify a few things for me. Um, what is the total amount of the um, um, low income um, rate assistance program as uh, with the proposed changes? Uh, currently, I believe we've authorized up to twenty-five thousand. Um, does Does Heather? I I do not have that number offhand. I can do it. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I mean, is is uh, my question is, are we proposing to increase it beyond twenty-five thousand? Gail's been in the discussions with budget and finance, so. Uh, the, the answer to your question, Bob, is is right now the we're um, the program is is very underutilized, um, and we have less than a hundred people enrolled. We think from looking at census tract data and also information from PG&E that 
potentially there could be 200, 300 people that could enroll in this. Um, and so right now we're, uh, the amount of money that we're spending is uh, a little less than $10,000. So even if we doubled it or, um, you know, went up by 15 uh, to $15 a month, there's, we're still under the 25,000 authorization. So um, I'm, I'm not making any formal recommendation. You might've noticed on that slide, it was just, here's a possible way that what we're trying to do is target low income uh, families. And there's definitely room within the existing program uh, to raise it and, uh, and accommodate more people. Okay, so no, no change beyond the 25,000 contemplated at this point. Not at this point. Okay. Um, I um, noticed that there was no mention of a, um, a drought surcharge uh, construct. Has, has that been dropped completely? Uh, the idea of needing a drought surcharge would have been if we had a lower fixed cost, but with the fixed cost percentage of 45%, we believe that that will give us enough stability. So if the um, if conservation is 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 increased and our we receive less in volumetric rates, the fixed costs will cover that. That is one of the reasons why we increased it from from um, um, 30 to 45 and not the 35 number was for stability. Um, is there going to be a pro forma PNL done on our um, for our current fiscal year uh, reflecting these uh, new rates? Um, hadn't thought of it, but I could easily do one of those. I, it might be. I, I mean, I'm given the fact that when I look at the numbers, uh, it seems like most of them are are going down, except for a, a handful of um at least for the current fiscal year let, let's be honest <laughs> for the course of five years um at the end of that five-year period we will be uh 250 percent above where we were in 2013. um but in terms of just understanding where we are <clears throat> with at least the current fiscal year um i think that would be a prudent thing to do there th these rates once they get adopted aren't going to have a huge impact on the current fiscal year especially if we push out that public hearing date they probably won't be able to go in effect until March. So these rates would only have an impact of four months. So it's not going to be a large impact in the current fiscal year. It'll be future years where we see that increase. It might be worthwhile to do it for 2025 then if, if um, <clears throat> okay. Um, basically, what I'm trying to do is get an, M <clears throat> excuse me, um, still recovering from some things here. So apologize for my my scratchy voice. Um, I'm just trying to get a, a sense of how the actual numbers line up given fairly significant changes in how the rates are structured. Um, the next question is on the, the peaking costs. So I'm, I'm a little unclear. As at, at one point in time, in order to have tiered rates, um, you had to have justifiable costs associated with those tiers. Is that no longer the case? Uh, have the court cases basically wiped that out? Sadir or Teresa, can you answer that question for me? Sure. Uh, no, we still we still have to you have to still have to show the cost basis for each of those tiers. So that's why we treat those individual tiers as sort of mini sub subclasses, if you will. So we look at the usage that would fall into that proposed uh, first tier and say, what's their max month? What's their average month, et cetera, to get their, their peaking impact. So we see that we do that for tier one, we do that for the usage that falls within tier two, same for tier three, same as we do for the commercial class, the industrial the, uh, and the irrigation classes. So that's um, that serves as the cost basis for those tiered and the uniform customer class rates. Yeah, I'm I'm still not sure I'm I'm following that. Sorry. So um, the the justification for the different tier rates has to do. It sounds like with cost associating with peak time. Um, what is that peak time, and what are those costs? 
peak consumption is what we are looking at. That is, you know, compared to the average usage, how much they are peaking. And as we, Teresa but, mentioned. But, but, excuse me, sorry. But that's peaking inside of the overall system, correct? That's what's driving that, the cost, not that's right. whether or not somebody, I mean, whether, for example, if someone had a, 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 an irrigation system where they did all their irrigating between midnight and 2 a.m., that doesn't have the same peaking cost impact on the system as if they were doing it at the system's peak hour. What is the system's peak hour? And what are the costs associated with that peak hour that justify the uh, tiered costs? So there are two ways of looking at that. One is called, you know, what you've just mentioned, coincident peaking versus non-coincident peaking. The methodology that we are using basically looks at the non-coincident peaking. So we, we look at individual peaking factors, not looking at what time of the day they're actually peaking and how that is impacting the system. We're looking at the individual peaking factors. We don't know when that water is being used by what customer. So we just look at the actual peak that is generated by each customer class and by each tier to come up with the rates that we have come up with. The costs associated with those peaking are based upon the system design you know, the over design that is required to meet those peaks. Right. But if the overall system design, which presumably is mostly around the, the infrastructure, the size of the pipes and, and the like, which is what I think I gathered from your presentation, that directly relates to, in fact, what the peaking is, the peak hour is for the system. That's right. Right. So what is the peak hour for the system and what is the utilization of that um, and how does that relate to costs associated with justification for peak hour uh, charges? So we have the max day peak at 1.5, which means that, you know, on a max day, you're using one and a half times what the average usage is. The peak hour is two and, and a quarter, which means that it's two and a quarter times the average daily usage. So is when we actually... Is there actually a period of time on our system that reflects that? Or is that just a calculation that you guys are doing? This is based upon, you know, information that we receive from the district could be part of the master plan uh, and or, you know, the, I don't, Teresa, I, I don't recall where we got this data from, but uh, this is uh, related specifically to your system. Yeah, it was provided by district staff. And so what, what time of day is the peak hour? The peak believe... hour just on, on a system-wide basis just measures the total peak usage that is compared to the average usage. So on the on the day that you have the maximum day usage, you look at the maximum hourly usage on that particular day to come up with the peak hour. And what and what was that? I just said it's two and a quarter times the. No, no, no. What time? Director, of day? are you actually looking at the for the time of day? So I, I I spend most of my career in telecom, and we do the similar thing with with peak hour, peak busy hour for telecommunications. And I can tell you precisely what the hour is. I can tell you precisely what the utilization is on the system at the time. Um, I'm trying to get a, a feel here for. Is this a heuristic calculation that we did on peak hour? Or is there actually a peak hour, and we know that that drives costs? And right, um, there is not actually a peak hour on how these rates were actually calculated. That okay. is not the data that they received. So, based on what Teresa and Sadir have said, that is not information that they can provide you. I am happy to talk with our engineering staff, and my guess is they can probably give me that information to provide to you. But that's not yeah, how the I, rates I, are based on a particular. I, I'm just trying to figure out time. how to relate peaking costs to to peak, uh, in order to justify the tiered rates. And I, I'm not, I, I'm I'm having a difficult time uh, reaching that uh, conclusion. Okay, um, next one was on capital charge. Um, what is the capital charge intended to cover? It recovers the capital related costs. So um, any debt service you have and then any cash finance capital that you may have. Um, 
So is the intent to cover 100% of that or some fraction of? Yeah, so any anything that's not, anything that's left over after all of your grants and FEMA, et cetera, that goes into the capital charge and that's what we're recovering through that charge. Okay, so our current debt payments, I think, run roughly $2 million. Um, and that doesn't include any other, you know, capital infrastructure that we might have. I think I calculated the capital charge at about eight hundred thousand for the year, uh, at least for the for this for this coming year, the first year. Uh, obviously, we'll go up from there. Uh, so, what? Uh, I, I'm still not clear as to what that capital charge is covering if it's intended to cover all of our. Uh, debt service. The capital well, we, we net out other there are revenue offsets that we net out. So like your taxes and assessments and things like that can be used towards paying that capital. So some of it is as as netted as netted out. Okay. And but we it, do that but, on the on the operating side as well. But it, it really it sounds like it's more of a debt service charge, not a capital charge, because our our capital requirements each year run between four and five million dollars. That is in terms of the infrastructure that we have to replace every year in order just to stay current. That's based on the asset value of the of the uh, of the entity. So the, the capital charge is really a debt service charge net out property tax revenue that we get, which is roughly in the order I think of a million more or less, um, and is focused strictly on debt service. Only, only and any any cash capital that you would be paying, which right now um, the finance doesn't show that. We look at you know on the on the financial plan that was approved. There's debt proceeds and um, FEMA funds, grants, et cetera, that are covering that. So there's there's not a separate cash component too, but it's any capital related costs, net any offsets. But but again, it's 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 debt related because our capital requirements are way more than 800,000 a year. Yeah, um, that, that's what I'm saying. That's why it's capital related. So any cash capital and any debt service. Okay. Less offsets. I, I think the, the vocabulary may be the issue there because when I think of capital charge, I think of um, overall capital, um, cost of capital. That is, what is it, what does our district require to spend every year in order to keep up with the, uh, um, infrastructure that's aging and needs to be replaced. Um, your, uh, the way you're using capital is within the context of debt service capital. Um, understand that now. Thank you very much for, for clarifying that. It, it, it's it, In the it, first year, basically, that's what it is. Yeah, it's basically a debt service yeah. offset by the taxes. And the revenue requirement from that, from our perspective, is just under $800,000, yes. And um, does that did that reflect the additional loan that you were recommending that we take out immediately in order to, quote unquote, have reserves? <laughs> mm. Or does that reflect just what we're currently? Um, um, I, um, we uh, show given the timing of that, we wouldn't expect you to have any debt service payments until 2025. So for that new loan. Okay, so then will the, let me just quickly pull up the uh, numbers here. Um, will the capital charge then uh, reflect? Is it being increased sufficiently over the course of the next year to accurately reflect then what our Debt service capital charge less property taxes will then require in order to cover effectively three loans, not just the two that we have now. Teresa, hold on. Let me ask a question of you and Sadir to see it, make sure I don't make sure I understand this well. And so I can help the director. Um, the fixed charges are not meant to cover 100% of the capital costs. Some of the vol volumetric charges are also going to be paying for some of that capital cost. 
that is when we had that discussion from going from 31 to 35 to 45 percent is going to be a fixed component. It is not meant that fixed component part of the rate is not meant to cover 100 percent of the capital costs. Teresa, am I correct? Um, as, as capital sort of varies from year to year, then you, you may or may not be covering a hundred percent, but, uh, you know, we're not, yeah. But I mean, the volumetric charge will make up for any difference, correct? That's true. Yeah. Thank okay. You. okay. Well, I mean, I, I understand from the margin point of view, uh, final question on the capital charge, is that then a dedicated fee? That is, it can only be used to offset our um, uh, debt charges that aren't covered by property taxes and perhaps other um, cash we get and cannot be used for operating expenses. That would have to be um, a, a, an accounting decision, policy, whatever, on, on the district side. Yeah, it doesn't have to be restricted yeah. only to capital costs it can be right. used it's just a, an, a way of separating out from the other fixed charges and the volumetric rate but it doesn't necessarily tie it only to paying for capital costs I, you don't need to do even separate accounting on that per se it's basically just a way of collecting those costs separately to increase your fixed charge component well, I mean, depending, I mean, what we're really doing is we're going out to the community with a contract effectively. Um, and if for whatever reason, we're making this a separate line item, there there ought to be some background around the contract that's being entered into with the uh, with the community. If it's just mainly a, um, a accounting gimmick, um, then I, I don't really see any value in it. Um, if it's dedicated specifically for capital, and not to be used for operating expenses, then there might be some value to it. At least that's the contract you'd make with the community. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the uh, the background on this. Okay. Um, I appreciate the presentation um, and the clarity in my mind that's in the various tables that are here. Um, I spent a fair amount of time this week going through these um, and like the way the presentation um, is done for us. It made a uh, non-financial person from me being able to uh, go through this and understand what was here. Um, I agree with the fact that uh, this is not a, a pleasant process that we're going through here. This is difficult and somewhat painful, but um, in order to keep the district um, Solvent, we need to be able to increase rates. Uh, in order to build up reserves, we need to be able to increase rates. Um, we've set the rate or the recommendation in here at 45% uh, of a 45% uh, on the fixed charges. Um, is that uh, typical for other districts now? Uh, from what you're seeing, uh, Teresa Sadir? Uh, it, it varies by by district or city. I had some are, you know, in the 30s, and I have others that are up around 50. So it's okay. it's okay. So so we're not out of the um out of the we're not even at the high range yet. No. Okay. Okay. Can I just add it? Sure. Point to that. Um, we're we're within sort of the norm, but one of the interesting things is when you look at some of the smaller districts, like in the Sierra, that are spread mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. mountainous, have some of the same issues. They they tend to be on the high side of fixed. Some of them are like really large. So okay. we're definitely you know kind of okay. congruent with that. Okay. Um, I do want to uh, come back to the uh, question on schedule uh, that's being asked uh, by uh, by Jamie uh, as to whether uh, we put this in front of the uh, the board 
at our next meeting or whether we uh, allow for another uh, period of time. Um, we invited uh, numerous uh, groups to a previous meeting. I, I don't remember when that was. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's right. It was in September that we did that. Seven and, 14. And, and from my perspective, we had a, a low turnout at those meetings. Am, am I correct in that? That it was, and it was to talk it, about this. Well, so, that's a different, I'm, I'm sorry, if I could, you're talking sure. about very different things, right? So t talking about the theoretical, mm -hmm. you know, structures of how, you know, whether we want to pursue this kind of uh, rate structure, that kind of rate structure, I, yeah, most people aren't tuned in at that point. People tune in when you put dollars to it. And that's what we've done for the first time here. And so I, I, I take issue with the idea that that should, one, supplant any, um, you know, need for additional outreach. And two, I don't even think it's the same thing. We weren't talking about what people's actual rates were going to look like. Mm -hmm under the proposed structure, we were just talking about different approaches to the rate structure at that point. Right. So I, I, I'm not sure that we've given them the opportunity to see this. Right. Uh, to amplify somewhat what Jamie has said, if, if we had it to do over again, I wouldn't have even had those early sessions because the, the subject matter was, if you weren't an expert of, mm -hmm. yes. in, our, in our budget and all of that, yeah. Was was very difficult to follow anyway. So, right, too high of a level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, too abstract. We, level. Yeah, we were at a strategic level at that point. And now yes. we're down to the tactical. With, yeah, here's yeah. what people want to know: what it's going to cost. Them. Yeah, yeah. What's it going to cost me? And that is, you know, mm -hmm. one of the slides here. What's yeah. it going to cost a typical uh, for six CCF? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mark. I, I get your point, Jamie, and it really only matters when it, people can look at the tables and say, okay, this is how it's going to hit me. But I would notice that um, there's only three people in the audience here and maybe a few online, and this is a time that people can look at the numbers. And, you know, that we're, we're offering um, people an opportunity to talk about them tonight. And so... I, I'm sensitive to what you're talking about, but I think we also have to balance that with um, every week we put this off, it costs us about $20,000 in revenue for the district. So, but, you know, we, we have to decide what, what do we gain by putting off um, this in terms of what what are we going to get in feedback that will will actually be able to change things here's here's my view of this is that outreach at this point is trying to explain the plan right and educate people and you hope that you convince them that this is the right path but maybe you won't and they will uh, vote against it but I really have a hard time imagining a situation where we're going to have uh, individuals in the public come in and say, well, this is too much. Um, here's what, how I want you to fix it. I only want my bill to be X. You know, it's, it's hard to see how feedback in that way is actually going to effectively do something. It may make you feel better that you've, you've gone through that, but um, I... I just, I'm just trying to figure out like, okay, you get feedback and then what do you do? We can get feedback on things like how we might expand the Lyra program or um, things that, you know, can easily be done, but to go and redo a rate study because people don't like the numbers, I, I just don't see that happening. So, you know, that. Okay. Okay. I, I appreciate that, that it is unlikely that we will get public feedback that would materially change what we're proposing here. But I, I also think that as a, a public agency, we have an obligation to seek it, whether we, you know, whether it's going to materially change it or not, we, we have to do our best 
to try and reach people. And I, yeah, people aren't here tonight. There's also a big meeting going on right down the street about Big Basin Water tonight that's happening, you know, coincident to this. So not to say that they would all be here, but I'm just saying like there's other things that are going on and we have not done the work of going out to the public and saying, okay, here's what you're looking at. Tell, you know, here's your opportunity before we vote to start this process. And, you know, I, I, I have, uh, I, I think that, that we are missing a step as an agency if we don't at least have that opportunity for, for the public to comment before we are voting on moving the rate study itself forward. Um, I do, I do want to reflect on that, but I did want to come back since Bob has his hand up also. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I mean, generally, I agree with with um, the sentiments that, that Jamie's expressing. Um, I, I think probably the uh, maybe the, the cynicism part of this is, you know, within a Prop 218 process, which doesn't really follow any of our democratic norms, uh, including, you know, a minority report or pro and con arguments. Um, you know, what's the practical effect going to be relative to uh, whether or not this passes? Um, I, I mean, I think doing this whole process over the the holiday period is the opposite of transparency. Uh, people will, I mean, starting in about uh, two weeks, people are going to be distracted for most of the rest of the year. Um, so, you know, there, 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 we're, there we are. I, I think a stronger communication to the to the public would include the commitments and the contract that we're made that we would make with them we've chosen not to do that as a board um so uh, you know i don't i don't know that you're really going to communicate uh, anything to them i mean at the end of five years we have no plan for getting um our pension uh, issues down we have no plan for maintaining our steel tanks we're going to be, still be spending about half of what we need to be spending every year just to stay current with our um, infrastructure. Uh, and our operating expenses are going to go up more than what uh, is in the model because that's historically what has always been the case. So, uh, I mean, wh while I, I tend to agree with with Jamie on, on the concept and would certainly support her motion to delay this uh, uh, a month, the fact of the matter is the board isn't doing anything substantive to really communicate to our community how we're going to manage this money other than we're going to continue doing what we've done in the past and it has never matched what has been in the model. Um, Jamie, you, th you threw out the possibility of um, and have staff return instead of December or instead of November 16th, uh, December second. Is it second? Second that we meet. Um, December 2nd. Uh, wait, the, the first meeting in December, right. whenever that is. Oh, sorry, that's the seventh. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, this December 7th. Do uh, you really distinctly think that? Uh, uh, the you, the admin committee, could put something together in that, you know, some type of a uh, presentation. Would you see doing that at the next board meeting? Uh, kind of, how would that? Uh, what? I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to go beyond that. But if, but if there's value in that, and it could be done. So right. what's your thought on how that would be? Well, unfortunately, the admin committee is going to be receiving um, a presentation from our uh, public outreach consultant tomorrow mm -hmm. on this issue. And um, what I had planned to discuss in that context was um, a virtual meeting uh, separate and apart from our, our board process where we would, you know, choose a, a different day, different time, maybe, you know, I, I, I think that we need to hear from Miller Maxfield on that, but um, where 
people who may not be able to come to a board meeting for various reasons would have an opportunity to hear about it and learn about it and um, offer comment in, in, a, in a virtual setting. So, um, you know, and not as a full board discussion. Um, and, you know, then we would then have that feedback and, and convert, you know, from that virtual meeting to consider when we make the vote on whether or not to proceed with the Prop 218 process. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, um, with Thanksgiving in there, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a challenge, but I would I would hope that we could put together some kind of a virtual meeting where we would essentially be presenting a very similar presentation to what um, Teresa and Heather presented tonight um, to those who, you know, are able to attend that and learn more about it before we take the next vote. Um, that was my hope with the conversation that we're going to have tomorrow yes. at the admin committee meeting, so... Okay. Um, okay. Well, um, we have a, a, a motion in front of us here. Maybe comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, let me let me go to this. We have a motion in front of us here, um, but uh, no, it's very similar to the to the last discussion that we had on the PVI uh, before we resolved on a motion to put out. I solicited a public comment. I'd like to do the same on this one because I'm uh, not getting a sense of concurrence from the board on on this uh, at this point. So um, does anybody here in the public um, want to comment on this uh, aspect? Yeah, thank you. I'm still Rick Moran. I'm still... <laughs> Um, I full heartedly support having a tiered system to promote conservation. I've argued for that in the past, and I support us going ahead and actually reinstituting a tiered system. Um, when Miller Maxfield, the public outreach company here, is doing this outreach, I would hope that they would follow a format that, or give an opportunity. I, understand Bob's uh, point about the 218 process itself doesn't call for a pro and con thing, but I would think that uh, to promote participation and uh, you know conversation about this, that we give people an opportunity to see some uh, somebody represent um, the side that is not necessarily in favor of the recommendation. Okay, so uh, we see that in all our state elections. We have pros and cons. I think we should follow that some sort of system that uh, duplicates that. Um, also, if the public meeting could be held in a large facility like the Ben Lomond Senior Center or the Felton Community Hall, that would help promote the greatest public participation. Now, um, it's a great idea to have a virtual meeting as well, but uh, the last a uh, rate increase was well attended and it was held at the senior center. So I think that people will attend once the dollars are associated with this thing. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else here? If not, uh, Eric Martin from Boulder Creek again. Um, I hear a 45% increase, you know, based in over four or five years. Um, but what I'm not hearing in outside of what Bob was talking about as far as debt service or whatever, I think the goal should be to create some sort of messaging that the average high school freshman or sophomore would understand. Mm -hmm. Most people, when they come home from work, they've had a long day, long commute, and then they got then they got to brain power through something that is important. But if they're out of brain power, they're not going to read it. They're not going to pay attention or they're not going to participate. This needs to be something that they either is a mailing or some process that they can, excuse my language, take in the bathroom, have sit down and read in language that they can understand. Uh, when I heard capital, I'm thinking, oh, okay, tanks or pipes or buildings or something like that. I never would have connected debt servicing for that, and which is necessary, don't get me wrong, but this goes to the transparency and the understanding 
just because there's a language that people in that world use, not everybody uses the same language. So you tell me what I'm getting for my bucks. 40 for 45 percent rate increase sounds horrendous. But 45 percent on a 60 or 70 dollar bill, you know what? If that's what it takes to run the place, I don't have a problem with that. Just tell me what I'm getting. And again, flogging a dead horse. I don't want to see the same stuff happening over again. We had the CZU fire, which burned out all a lot of probably almost 80 years worth of fuel. And now with the next project, you're talking about adding new fuel on the ground because you're not going to take the trees out. And then you're going to put a flammable pipe on the ground. <laughs> Sounds to me like you're you're looking at that process as a temporary short-term, we'll fix it next time, we'll fix it next time, we'll fix it next time. But if that's not the case, then put the, put in the surcharges that you're charging for the plastic plastic laying plastic on the on the on the forest floor and you're waiting for it to burn and we need some mice so when it burns we can put it in next time but this a lot of the language was incomprehensible to a lot of people me included I like I said I never would have guessed by just reading some of those charts what they were actually talking about and that goes back to the transparency thing thank you okay um folks that are online um uh, april uh silver hi thank you i'm assuming you can hear me unless you tell me otherwise um yeah i appreciated the presentation tonight it was rather dense the slides went by really fast i do look at financials sometimes but um i had a hard time uh, wrapping it all up in my mind and I agree the vocabulary is specialized vocabulary and it would be very helpful I agree with Jamie that it would be really helpful for the community to be able to come to a meeting or get something in the mail that or watch a recorded presentation that's um, pitched to the average person who doesn't have a financial background so that we can all understand what's going on. And me being a low water user, I'm happy. My rate is not going to go up, but I'm sure other people who have big families are going, uh-oh. So it would be good for us all to understand that better. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else um, online want to comment? Seeing none. Uh, then I'd like to come back to, uh, we have a motion as written in front of us. I'm not, uh, can you can read the, the motion, please? Sure. Um, board accepts, I move that the board accept the staff report concerning the utility rate structure and direct staff to return on November 16th, 2023 with us with a resolution authorizing staff to move forward with the Prop 218 process with the presented rates. I, I don't even like the motion, to be honest with you, because it's like we're telling, we're saying we're going to um, approve this on the 16th. I don't know. It, it feels like it's... I'm, I'm willing to uh, listen to uh, an alternate or revised motion. The uh, one that doesn't appear to be as much of a done deal. Well, um, um, <laughs> well I, I think you need to add in there um, something about community outreach, a, a community outreach with a simplified version of the uh, presentation. Okay. I does I like where you're sense? going. So, so that if we said something like the board accepts, I just, uh, I, I actually don't know why we need to take uh, this motion tonight. Like the, the the staff can bring back the the rate study um, on the 16th if they want to and ask us to vote for it. We don't need to direct them to do that. So, you know, why can't our motion be that, you know, we're, we are directing staff to take the necessary steps to ensure that there is a, you know, public outreach opportunity 
um, you know, the question becomes when, but it, you know, mm -hmm. within the next I, I want, I want 30 to, days. I want to see if we can get, you know, some date certain into this, mm -hmm. um, with, uh, you know, we're talking about board meetings on the 16th of November, the 7th of December. Um, and I certainly hope that we're at a point I know later than December 7th. Right. But so what uh, what are you then proposing that we're asking staff to yes, they could bring this back to us uh, on the 16th. Uh, Gail? Well, I think what I would say is one thing you could vote on is that at the minimum, as part of the motion, that you accept the staff report yes. that we heard tonight. Okay. So in other words, you're not telling them when go totally back to the drawing board, we right. reject this out of hand. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not that we're we're approving it, but right. it's it, at least it's that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, beyond that, um, whether you want to, you know, what you want to specify, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Mark. I really don't want to put this off past the 7th of December. I, that's kind yeah. of a, um, I, 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 go ahead, Holly. Um, I just Sorry. wanted to point out that, first of all, a large public meeting is not recommended. I was just at um, uh, a hospital today and they are back to wearing masks. Yeah. It's a mandate that yeah. they mm -hmm. started yesterday. And so I don't think that's a good idea. I think that possibly a virtual meeting could would be a good idea. But um, really getting together as a large group is not, yeah. in my opinion, recommended. So I don't think we, the more I think about it, we don't, we don't really have to vote on anything on this at the moment. Um, first of all, the admin committee is going to talk about outreach among other things tomorrow and we would come back to the board meeting the next board meeting the outcome of that meeting uh whatever recommendation we come up with and uh and i wish i could talk better uh and this proposal can come back to the board at the next meeting and we can decide to vote on it or not we don't have to vote on it tonight. I mean, we don't have to. We don't have to vote to have staff bring it back next week for in two weeks for another vote. We can. It, that can just be arranged on the agenda. Um, That's a good question. I, I, uh, Gail was making the suggestion of uh, we accept this uh, report. Yes, is that the. Uh, is that the way you were saying yeah. that we accept this uh, as presented this evening yes. so that we can say, yes, we're done with this part of it. So, uh, and then yeah. the aspects of what next, we can yeah. begin to craft that also. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, before I go to you, uh, Bob has had his hand oh, up for sorry. a while. I want to see what... Bob? Uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I've been through a number of these now, and and at least at the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, they all kind of follow the same path, and we're we're on we're on that same path where, you know, for whatever reason, the outreach around rate increases it, it has has looked to me to be more ad hoc rather than methodical, deliberate, structured and sustained over a fairly long period of time. I mean, there's the occasional Facebook posting, but, uh, but, but you know, that, that's about it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine, you know, having, uh, trying to do more in, in the month of November prior to a meeting in December. Um, but given that we're, that you're just getting that presentation tomorrow, I, I mean, I do have to ask, is there, a, I mean, I'm completely opposed to having this over the holiday anyway. Let me start there, because I, I think that is the antithesis of transparency with your community. 
But given that you're just now starting a presentation from your um, uh, from Miller Maxfield, who again their track record on outreach is also mixed, um, are we really looking at having anything substantive? Do Do you think anything's going to come out of it tomorrow that's that's really going to be in the in November um, that significant? I I want to defer to the admin committee and give them the opportunity to have that discussion. Okay, fair I, enough. I, because I, because here's the schedule: you have the meeting tomorrow. You've got two weeks before Thanksgiving week. People check because Thanksgiving is a little bit earlier this week, um, and then after Thanksgiving, you've got basically um, one and a half weeks before the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we're all aware of that here. Yeah. You, you think that's possible to do anything substantive, basically that last week in November? That's what I have to. Be. I I don't know what you would define as substantive, Bob, but I I think that it is possible to do, um, in my opinion, uh, a virtual public outreach meeting. Um, where we break this presentation down uh, in a more approachable and accessible manner so that people understand what we will be taking up to vote on on December 7th um, prior to having the, the staff come back with a resolution to begin the Prop 218 process. So I'm sure that you will take issue with whether that's substantive, but I, I do think it is possible to do that. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that. And hopefully they'll also have insights on uh, what they will do in the next two weeks uh, after tomorrow to sort of help lead up to that, right? Um, because we've, we, like I say, we've not really had a sustained methodical um, communication from uh, the district um, uh, up, up until recently. Okay, no, let's let's try it out and see, uh, Jamie. I definitely want to give you the uh, uh, a lot of leeway and and runway here to do that. Okay, Gil. I I would just say that in your conversation with Miller Maxfield, I think that um, people's attention is really going to happen after they've gotten the notice, right? Yeah. Right, and so one could argue that that's you know when the most conversations and education and it should happen. Um, so I hope that even if you insist on having one before we vote, that there is also something after the notices come out because that's when most people are going to be paying attention. I, I just predict you're not going to have much attention before that because just there's nobody here tonight. Um, not quite nobody. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and there's, you know, relative. There's not many bodies out there here or elsewhere. So, uh, but I did have a technical question that I'd like to ask um, uh, Heather and Teresa. If she's still there, is are we actually talking about putting together two Prop 218 notices, one for the wastewater and one for the water, or are they yep. together? It would be going together. It would be one Prop 218 notice. Okay. Hmm. I don't. Okay. I don't like. I, but they. But they. But they vote separately, don't they? The, they. They do indeed. Yeah. yeah. So I, the reason I'm asking this is I'm wondering whether it, whether this is a, again a divisible question that we can say please go ahead and prepare for the next board meeting the Prop 218 for the Bear Creek Estates water is that. Wastewater. Wastewater, excuse me. Wastewater. Um, you know, if, but maybe there's no value in, in doing that, but I, I, I do believe that it has to be separate because it's a different voting public. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. And I don't yeah, think I, in fact, certain... having outreach to the wastewater guys could be fairly easy to do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's only 54 of them or something like that. 56, but yeah. 56, yeah. Easy. Is is that so? In other words, like what I'm saying is, we could have a motion that says tonight that we accept the report, and a second part that says basically instruct blah blah blah, but for the wastewater part. Yes. Is that 
Yes. Um, and we're requesting, are we requesting anything of staff at this point on this no. outreach aspect? No, I, think I would be thing. directing staff to ensure that we have a public outreach meeting in advance of the December 7th um, mm -hmm. board meeting. Yeah, but here, we're not directing them tonight, staff, to do anything. That'll come after we could. We could. we could. I mean, we know we're going to get a presentation from Miller Maxfield tomorrow that's outlining right. what we can do, right, for mm -hmm. public outreach. But we can tell the staff tonight, like, it's our expectation that that something happen before we come back to um, uh, pass the, the Prop 218 process. I understand we can do that, but if we direct them to do, quote, something, they won't do anything because we haven't really told them what to do. Well, public, I'm saying we're directing them to hold a virtual public outreach meeting. I understand that we're, that's putting the cart before the horse a bit in terms of Miller Maxfield, but uh, um, that's where we are. And direct staff to, to conduct public outreach uh, with guidance from the admin committee. There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Is that... Does and that kind of get get us there? Let you have the discussion with Miller Maxfield. Let you filter out what what you think you can do with them. Yes. And the timing with them, um, and do that before the next. Okay. But we can. But not. But yeah. she said it's. Not you have to tell them when. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I ask a clarifying question, please. Sure. Um, what I hear from this board is that you want to, um, assuming it can be done, and and we'll know more tomorrow, a public outreach done before the rates are presented to you again. Yes. And you, at this point, don't have expectations of that occurring November 16th, that it'll occur December 7th instead. That's I mean, that's, I don't think it's realistic to think that we could have a, a some kind of separate meeting with the public before the November 16th meeting. I, I completely agree. I'm just making sure it's all really clear on, on the expectations of the board. Right. Thank well, you. that's what we're trying to. Okay. Um, then what about this? Um, move that the board accepts the staff report. Uh, concerning the utility rate structure as presented on November 2nd, 2023. Uh, direct staff to conduct public outreach uh, based on input from the admin committee um, and and uh, what in return, um, by no later than December 7th, 2023, with resolution authorizing staff to move forward with the Prop 218 process with the presented rates. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I put a motion out. Okay. Yep. I would second that motion. Oh, okay. I, I noticed that there's a member of the public with their hand up. And I've searched for that and I can't see. His name Mike is Mike Smith. Smith. Oh, okay. My eyes are blanking at this point. Um, okay, we have a motion out in front of us now. Uh, we have a member of the public who wants to comment. Uh, Mr. Smith, go ahead. Oh, Mike Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, you're muted. Okay, uh, can you hear me at this point? We can. Okay, this is Michael Smith. I'm a third generation uh, property owner off Two Bar Road. And I'd just like to say that I'm one of the public that are watching us on virtual and will continue watching. Very interesting. I'm in congruence with Mr. Bob Fultz and his attitude and his uh, methodology for helping us understand as a public. And it's really helping out a lot. That was my comment and thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
We have a motion out in front of us. Um, are, we ready? are we ready to vote on this? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, I get that feel. Uh, Holly, would you take a... President Smalley? Yes. Director, uh, Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Director Falls? No. Okay, motion passes. Um, it's past 9.30, uh, but uh, we still have a few procedural things to take care of. Uh, any um, uh, comments on the consent agenda item that's here? Hearing none, uh, district reports. Uh, does anybody want to uh, comment or question on those? Uh, not seeing any hands up here. Uh, not seeing any online. Uh, then I think we can adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Three adjournments. Thank you. Good night.